Yeah. <laughs> That's terrific. Okay. Mm -hmm. My name is Mr. Patsy, and I'm going to take you through your study journey as you start your your SBR. I is it? I uh, sorry, I'm just trying to turn off the camera. Well, it's still fine. You can access it on your just in between your mute and yang up tab. You can, okay. you can see this. The, okay, fine. Okay, so without taking much of your time, let me let me right away. Let us discuss today's uh, today's issues. You know, it's quite a lot and quite involving. So let us right away get started. I'm sure you are all seeing my screen. And unfortunately, I had to deactivate my camera because the, my system has just updated itself and I can't wait for it to finish all the functionalities because the updating will take us longer, where it will take long for us to start the lecture. Okay, so today we want to discuss groups. I'm sure everyone has, has, has the handout for groups. If you don't have it, allow me to send it in our Skype chat. I'm sending it just now. Uh, if you don't have the end out on groups. Um, okay, allow me to send it here. Mm -hmm. You know, when you are learning SPR, it's, 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 it's so important for you to, to realize that this subject is very easy. Very, very easy. You know, it's 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 that rare subject you'd when someone asks you what are you studying this semester, you you can actually say I'm studying a PM and I'm writing it with SBR, you know, that kind of thing. That's how you would wait your 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 response. Meaning it's 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 like a, it's like a subject which I'm yet to see one failing it really because from experience it's a very easy subject okay so i have sent if you can only if if you don't have the handout that we are going to discuss today can you please access it on the chat feature here you you just click on the chat icon and you can as well access it there you know why you may ask and say say why are you starting with groups the reason is the reason is Group financial statements, they account, they, they constitute your first question in the SBR exam. That's your first question. That's your first 30 mark question. So from experience, I noticed that if I delay the 30 mark question to the end, I run the risk of not building your confidence on time. So the, the reason we start with groups is to, you know, as a, as a student, you would agree with me that it is quite logical for you to start with number one question. This will actually enable you even in the interim to view questions and to appreciate how questions are examined. And like a situation where number one questions we defer to the later or to the, to the, to the last section of our syllabus. In that case, you will still not be in a position to even attempt any question because you'll be scared of with number one that ah, I'm yet to do this. So you would simply say, I'm yet to practice, I'm yet to practice. And in mitigation, no wonder why we start with number one right away. So please, uh, groups, these are the prerequisites. I understand you have done FR, which is the junior course to SBR, that's financial reporting, or you were exempted. Either way, it is still the same. You know, as ACCA, we... We have our exemption calculator, right? So whatever the course you have done elsewhere, which which made you eligible for exemption, still, it's quite it's quite cool. Don't don't don't. It's not an excuse to say I haven't done S B A F R. So perhaps I may not understand some of the things. It's not an excuse. As long as you were exempted, we are, we know that everything that we exempted you for you met the eligibility criteria. So you are the same with a student who has done FRA and you who are, we have started at SBR. But I must appreciate there are certain concepts, suppose you were doing a college degree, uh, there are certain approaches to, uh, you know, coming up with consolidation mechanics or for groups 
which was convenient and appropriate then, but we, 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 we need not to consider it now because at this juncture, we need to focus mostly on the ACCA approach to these particular questions. So that is what I'll be hammering home. Okay. So our quorum is now more than half. As long as our class is now more than half, we can start. You know, we are building up these classes and come next week, I'm sure the class will be growing. So they will still they have this particular issue of playing the videos. So you can still play the video. As you can see, how, you, how can you play the video? The videos are downloaded in the chat feature here. So as you can see, as long as you are in SBR class here, the video will be downloaded. The video is not sent to your inbox to your skype inbox but rather it's downloaded to your skype class but as you can see there's a mention here that the video is just available for 30 days so in mitigation to make the video long to 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 have the permanent record of the lecture we then stream these videos and you may notice that they are streamed by my colleagues and you can as, as well receive a copy of the streamed video so the streamed video will then be a permanent record of our lecture but as usual, I, I like you to join the lecture, not the, to play the recorded, because by joining, you participate in the actual lecture delivery, and that way it builds your confidence. Because if you are used to just playing recorded videos, it's, not, it's in a way not different from just reading a textbook in any way. But when you are actually actively participating, it will have educative effect. So the videos will be streamed on, on, on YouTube, you can as well like our youtube account and play all the relevant videos there it's my youtube account you access it it's mupatsi colin make sure you subscribe to that as well because you are in the class so that you keep yourself updated with any new video that we post on that platform okay so here yeah, i'm opening the I'm opening today's start material. So I gave you the notes, SBR notes from Mr. Mbatsi, and clearly this is where I extracted the end out. You know, some of the things is I just extract to try to take the salient features, the salient aspects of the topic at the end and eliminate all the non-essentials. Okay. So it's groups financial statements. Put loosely, some call it consolidated financial statements. And, and and any other business combinations and stuff. So that's what we are going to discuss. So today we want to, to take the rest of the lecture in, in explaining the processes, the mechanics, the consolidation mechanics involved. And at the end of the lecture, after explaining this handout, as you can see, the handout is a nine-page handout. It's actually a nine-page handout. So I'm going to explain this entire handout today and then I, I sent you the practice questions that we will then discuss in the next next lecture. Okay. Uh, oh, let me close this. You know, I was in a CFA lecture just now. So let me close this. You know, as you say, I'm always in lectures. I'm always in lectures. Okay. So the particular standards at the end, please pay attention and do the listening. Make sure you don't have anything distracting you. What we are going to discuss here is so important. As I have said, it's your 30 mark question, which is the number, which is number one question for in your exam. So please pay attention and you will like it, believe you me. So group financial statements. The standards in question being IFRS 3, business combination, and IFRS 10, consolidated financial statements. So these are the primary standards at hand, though we shall incorporate IS 28, you know, investments in associates and IFRS 11 joint arrangements later on in the course of our study. Now, IFRS 3, which is the standard on business combinations, actually defines a business as a, you know, as a structured and coordinated set of activities which can, which obtains inputs uh, and process them into outputs. In other words, there are processes in place to convert inputs into outputs and thereby generating rewards to entrepreneurs, uh, generating rewards to owners. Uh, how these rewards are generated being net of revenue, less expenses in the form of dividends, in the form of interest, in whatever form. That's a business. 
So a business, for you to define a business, it must have these three characteristics. It must obtain inputs, process inputs into outputs, and thereby creating returns or rewards to investors. That's a business. So by, by, by uh, knowledge of a business is important because a distinction is to be made between acquiring a business or a, and acquiring an asset. You know, if, 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 if whatever you acquired fails to meet these three characteristics, inputs, conversion of inputs into outputs through processes and generation of returns, enhancements of capitals to the investors, if it fails to achieve these three, we call it an asset acquisition. So if it's an asset acquisition, it, it is then accounted for in terms of the usual asset standards, like property, plant and equipment, intangible assets, whatever asset that you've acquired. But if it is this, it is acquired as a business. Now, this once, once your acquisition satisfies the criteria for it to be designated as a business, you then have to escalate it a little bit to consider the level of ownership. Level of ownership. What do we mean by that? We are saying, what is it that what is the controlling stake that we have acquired in this particular firm? And I'm sure this is like basic yes, basic issues, but allow me to go over them. If you acquire, suppose you acquire less than 20% of voting shares in an entity. You don't call that. You can't say, I now have a subsidiary if you have acquired less than 20%. Neither can you say, I now have an associate. So this acquisition is just accounted for as a simple investment in equity instruments. It's merely a simple investment in equity instruments. It's a financial asset. Can you imagine a situation where you just buy 200 shares from Old Mutual? You can't say I, Old Mutual is now my associate. Oh, sorry. Okay, guys, as part of housekeeping issues, whenever you realize that you have got any background noise, you, you mute. It's so important that you mute. Whenever you realize you feel like you want to say something and the background noise might might actually disturb your colleagues. I, I encourage you to mute. Okay, coming back to what I was saying. So, I was saying if you acquire, say, 20% of voting shares, less than 20% of voting shares in an entity, clearly you can't say the, the, the investee is your associate or a subsidiary. It is just treated as a simple investment in equity instruments, and we account for it as a financial asset in accordance with IFRS 9, meaning financial instruments. Now, according to IFRS 9, a financial asset can be recognized at fair value through profit or loss or fair value through OCI. We shall discuss this at appropriate standard when we are discussing financial instruments. Now, what if you acquire between 20 to 49% of voting shares in an entity inclusive, meaning from 20 to 49? What if you acquire that? Clearly, if, if suppose I acquire 30% of voting shares in an entity, I don't control the entity because my acquisition is just 30%, so that's a fact. But I am said to have significant influence over the investee. You can't just brush me aside if I have got, if I, if I, if I have acquired, if I have acquired, uh, you know, 30% of voting shares in your firm. Clearly, I now have what I call significant influence. Not a controlling in, influence. So you may ask and say, say, what is significant influence? Significant influence it simply means I now have some power to influence things, not to the extent of controlling though. Like, how can, how can we test for evidence of significant influence? 
you know, evidence of significant influence might be, I now have the power to appoint board members, some board members to the board of directors. Suppose this investee has got eight member board. If I can appoint three out of eight, though I don't control it by virtue of appointing three out of eight, but you can't say I don't have a significant influence. It's a significant influence. Are you getting it? So whenever the test for significant influence is met, meaning you've acquired, say, 20 to 49% of voting shares inclusive, we say the investee becomes the associate company of the investor. The investee here becomes the associate. So in other words, you account it for as an investment in associate, and the investment in associate is equity accounted. So I shall be taking you through what I mean by equity accounting for the investment in associate. Right? Um, and lastly, if you acquire at least 50% of voting shares in an entity, once you have acquired at least 50% of voting shares in an entity, we say you have now assumed control. You have now assumed control. And under the circumstances, we then say business combination has taken place. So a business combination arises when you assume control. From the date you assume control, that's the date a business combination takes place. So you as an investor and the investee, collectively, you become the group. And the investor is, is, is termed the parent and the, 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 the investee becomes the subsidiary. How then do we attest for the evidence that we have assumed control? Yes, the deal. Control is evidenced by quite a lot of things. You, you are said to have control if you are entitled to variable returns. In other words, one who owns the company or who controls the company does not have fixed returns. So if you, are, if, if you, are, if you receive variable returns, we say you control the company, even power to appoint the majority of members on the board, power to direct the operational and even the strategic direction of the entity. If you have all that vested in you, we say you control the particular company in its hand. All right? So once there is a business combination, once there is a business combination, it means the the, 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 the the companies involved they are now termed the group in other words they are con they are considered a single reporting entity so if a subsidiary has got if a parent has got three subsidiaries collectively they are considered a single reporting entity so what then need to happen is they need to prepare financial statements for the group and we call these consolidated financial statements so I freeze 10, that's the standard which focuses on consolidated financial statements. It then requires a parent to prepare consolidated financial statements, meaning group financial statements, which show the true and fair view of the results of operations for the group as a whole, meaning the group is treated as a single reporting entity. You get that? And now, here are the consolidation guidelines. In other words, this is how you, f you, consolidate, you consolidate a subsidiary. Now, before I come to consolidation guidelines, one may ask a question and say, say, don't we have a situation where the parent, isn't it possible to have a situation where the parent might not be required to prepare consolidated financial statements? And clearly, that would be a logical question. Such situations exist where the parent may not prepare consolidated financial statements. Number one, if the parent is an unlisted company, you know, if, if, if the parent is an unlisted company, chances are you, you may opt not to prepare consolidated financial statements. But the, this issue of the parent being unlisted, it does not apply to banks nor any other company, of course. I'm saying it may choose not to. 
not it must choose not to no generally the requirement is it to is that it has to prepare consolidated financial statements but it may choose not to if it's unlisted another or is an or is or if, if it's unlisted or is it still in the process of getting listed another is if the parent itself is also a subsidiary of another company so if Atlantic Resources, for example, acquires a subsidiary and Atlantic Resources itself is a subsidiary of another company. So in so doing, Atlantic might is not is not mandated to prepare financial statements, but the, the main parent is the one which has to prepare financial statements. You get what I'm talking about. Okay. Now, continuing. Consolidation guidelines. So consolidation guidelines here, yeah, we, are, we, are, we are focusing on how then do you proceed with the consolidation process? How then do you really proceed with the consolidation process? So please relax, please relax. That's where the whole thing, I, I'm now taking you through items that do matter. Allow me to open my Excel here. Uh, so that I can explain um, some of the consolidation guidelines that I want to take you through. The first guideline is consideration transferred. You know, by consideration transferred, we are simply saying the amount which is paid to acquire the subsidiary. That's consideration transfer, transferred. How much was paid to acquire the subsidiary? So there are various ways you can actually acquire a subsidiary, quite a lot of them. So one way of paying for the controlling interest, you can pay through cash. So this is basically the cash payment, immediate cash payment, the amount you pay on the date of acquisition. Now, another way you can acquire the subsidiary is fair value of parent shares issued in exchange. So we call this share exchange. So the subsidiary is acquired by way of share exchange. How does it how, how, how does it take place? Let, uh, let me show you. Share exchange. Then this is how you can pay for your acquisition. Let's say case in point is A. A acquired. A acquired. 80% of these shares, these shares by means of share exchange, by means of share exchange, by means of share exchange of one share, one share in A, for every for every two acquired shares one share in a for every two acquired shares um de uh, details details of the number of shares number of shares and their market prices and their market prices are given below. I mean, given and given below. Now, take note details of the number of shares in their market prices are given below. So, here, here you are. Um, so, we say shares of dollar each shares of dollar each of dollar each let's say this we have got two companies there's company a and there's company b now shares of dollar each uh, here let's say twenty thousand and twenty thousand and b let's say twelve thousand then market price market price 
these shares are trading at they have a market value of ten dollars ten dollars and here they have a market value of four dollars this is per share dollars per share right so there you go so that's the market price and 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 everything now we you what you need to know what you need to know is how do you account for the oh well there are some of your colleagues asking questions in the SBR class oh okay fine nicole okay thanks you you said you have managed to join okay so here's the deal what is consideration transferred so consideration transferred becomes consideration transferred meaning the amount that you pay to acquire this it will be remember you acquired 80 percent so 80 percent of how many shares of B shares times 12,000. These are B shares. But here's how you did it. You acquired it by means of share exchange, which is one share in A for every two shares acquired. So you then multiply by one, by one over two. Because you are saying one share in A for every two. If it was two shares in A for every one, you'd multiply by two over one. So there you go, you say equals 0.8, multiply by 12, 1, 2, 3, multiply by 1 over 2. So there you go, 4,800. But remember, remember, these are, okay, sorry, let me say multiply by, I omitted there, multiply by the market price, $10 multiply by the market price ten dollars so you say multiply by ten so it's forty eight thousand are you not seeing it it's like a the a is acquiring b by issuing its own shares so the shareholders of b are being told to give up their current shareholding in b and then take up one share in a and one share in a is trading at ten dollars so consideration transferred becomes 80% of 12,000 times 1 over 2 to get the number of shares which A has issued and then multiply by $10. Because one A is, is A is giving one share at $10 for every two acquired. Now, here's the deal. How do you account accounting accounting for shares issued in exchange shares issued in exchange ace books how would a then account for shares that it issued in exchange when it assumed when it acquired b now this forty-eight thousand here you need to know how does a account for this in its books because effectively speaking a is issuing additional shares. So what you then have to do is share capital, share capital of A, share capital of A, sorry, background noises, please mute, with, 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 with failing, Guys, David, so please mute. Right. Okay. What What is it that I'm saying? I'm saying on these shares issued in exchange, how are these shares accounted for in Ace Books? When you are now accounting for these shares in Ace Books, it's like the share capital of A the share capital of A increases increases by par value of share exchange exchange because you know 
when they are issuing shares in exchange, you are saying, I'm not going to pay you cash. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you my own shares. So effectively speaking, A is issuing shares. So, so what you do is you credit, you credit A's share capital, A's share capital, A's share, share capital, credit A's share capital by, uh, how many shares did, did we issue in exchange? We issued 80% times 12,000 times 1 over 2 times dollar. Remember, these shares are if a par value of dollar. So the par value will increase the, 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 ACE, the, the acquirer's share capital. So it will be like this. Uh, it will be like 0.8 times 12, 1, 2, 3, times 1 over 2, times dollar. So 4,800 is the additional shares we have issued. Now, what else? The, the excess is of market value of shares over their par value, market value of shares exchange issued in exchange over their power value and not see, this is how you you answer sbr sbr is about you be commenting what you do so the excess of market value of shares issued in exchange over their power value is recognized a comprehensive of in, in other components of equity is, I mean, in other components of equity is share premium. A premium. So what am I saying here? Remember, you issued 4,800 shares when you acquired B, but the, you issued them at 48,000, but their par value was $1. It means... 10 minus $1 was the share premium at the date of acquisition. So you would then say credit, credit ACE, other components of equity, meaning share premium, share premium, ACE, other components of equity, meaning share premium. It will be 80% times 12,000 times 80% times 12,000 times 1 over 2, then multiply by open bracket, $10 minus dollar. That's the share premium, minus dollar. And what do you get? So you're now saying equals this, multiply by $9. Share premium is $9. So of the 48 of the 48 that you acquired at acquisition, or that which was the market value of shares issued in exchange, you would notice you can break it down as par value goes to increase the acquirer's share capital. Because if you acquire by issuing shares, you are effectively increasing your share capital. But remember, you issued the shares at the market value at the date of acquisition. So what happens? Your share capital cannot increase by market value. Your share capital can only increase by par value. But if market value was 10 and par value was dollar, it means the shares you issued in exchange, they also increased your share premium. And share premium is recognized in other components of equity. I'm seeing something here. Uh, oh, okay. Right, cool. Are you getting what I'm saying? Oh, okay. Wait, you know these are inter these are interactive plugins. When I say, are you getting what I'm saying? You can just hit any of these buttons here. Here, it's it's like instant. It it gives me instant feedback. I know you you guys you don't want to. You you may you may you may be having background noises, so you need to 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 let me know whether whatever I'm saying is 
is, is someone listening to, <laughs> to what I'm saying. And I said quite a lot of you guys are listening. So let me repeat this in, and um, I'll move on to another element of consideration transfer because this is, this is mainly, it, it's commonly examined in, in your SBR paper. If you acquire a subsidiary by means of share exchange, effectively speaking, you are issuing shares. That's a fact. And you are issuing shares at their market price at the date of acquisition. That's a fact. So in other words, your share capital needs to increase, but you can't increase your share capital at market price. Your share capital increase by the par value, which is dollar in this case. So your consideration transferred was at $10, which is 48000 But if the 48000 can be split as your share capital increases by a dollar, uh, which is par value on the number of shares, 4.8. And the $9, because the market value was 10 so the $9, which is the excess or share premium, it goes to the other components of equity, which is your share premium account. I'm sure that says it. You now know uh, this is consideration transferred. This line I have just put in red is what we look for. But if you now want to account for it in the acquirer's books, that's what you then do. So this is not always required unless specifically asked by the examiner to split the consolidation, tra uh, the consideration transferred into its components when there is share exchange. Now, fair value of contingent consideration. Now, uh, what is a contingent consideration? A contingent consideration, it's a payment that you make to acquire a subsidiary, but it is based on a condition. You know, contingent means conditional. There are instances when you may acquire a company which is currently making loss. Suppose Atlas want to acquire a company and we want to pay 24 million. But clearly the company has been making losses for the past two years. We can't pay the full amount of 24 million. What we may do is we say of the 24 million, we are going to pay 19 million now. But the other 5 million, we will pay provided you, and you have revert to, you, you are now making profit. So whenever you set a condition, it means you, your payment that you, the payment that you are going to make upon fulfillment of that condition is called the contingent consideration. So it's called contingent consideration. It's like this. It's like this contingent consideration. Consideration. Now, take for example, I acquire a company today, but these are the conditions. Uh, I said to this, I say to this company, look, I'm going to pay you cash today. The cash I'm going to pay is 19 million. And then I say contingent consideration, denoted as CC, con contingent consideration of 5 million, the additional 5 million, additional 5 million if the firm reverts to profitability. If the firm reverts to profitability after two years, I mean, well, let's say not. Let me not say after, but let's say within within two years. So I may set this condition to say I'm going to pay. Uh, I'm going to pay. 5 million if the firm reverts to profitability after two years. So if 5 million is the fair value of contingent consideration at acquisition, it means purchase consideration becomes 19 plus 5. Meaning contingent consideration at fair value is included in the consideration transferred. You get it? So I may say consideration transferred, I can then add up the two and say my consideration transferred for this particular subsidiary is 24 million. But notice, the CC contingent trans consideration, it must be at fair value. It must be at fair value. In other words, as directors, we satisfy ourselves that the fair value is 5 million 
which is based on the fact that the company is going to make a profit in, in within two years. So let's say the, the fair value increases to okay, the fair value of contingent consideration increases to increases to five comma eight five comma eight million by end of first year by end of first year how then do you if the contingent consideration for example increases to five comma eight million by the end of first year how would you navigate it so so what you simply do is then the increase the in eight million zero comma eight million is debited profit or loss as an expense is debited to profit or loss as an expense as an expense i want to i want to illustrate how why why do we debit zero comma eight to profit or loss as an expense remember contingent consideration is a promise that you are saying you you pay it's like a promise to pay upon fulfillment of a condition so you promised to pay five million but the con the fair value then increases to five comma eight it's like it's now an expense or an obligation is increased and the obligation of zero comma eight million which is an increase I mean, of uh, the, the increase in obligation of 0, 0,8 million, it's like an expense. A liability is increased by 0, 0,8 million. So this becomes an expense. Debit, profit or loss by 0, 0,8 and credit the liability by 0, 0,8 to bring it to 5,8. So, so you, may, you may ask an obvious question and say, say, what if there was a decrease? A decrease, you would do the opposite. A decrease in fair value of contingent consideration would be credited to profit or loss as other income. So if the fair value of contingent consideration was 5 million and then it decreases to 4,5 million after you realize that, oh, chances of this company actually reverting to, to profitability are very slim. So we promised that we would pay them 5 million, but well, 5 million, it appears, was too much. Let us review it downwards to 4,5 million. If you review contingent consideration downwards to 4,5 million, what it would mean is the 0, 0,5 decrease in fair value of contingent consideration is credited to profit or loss as other income. You know, by profit or loss, I'm referring to consolidated profit or loss. You may... Because remember, we are doing group financial statements. So if I say this is credited to profit or loss, I'm referring to consolidated profit or loss. Next is, uh, uh, you may say, so say what, what happens to the closing, closing balance uh, on contingent consideration. You, you may say, say, we agree with you that 0, 0,8 increase, we put it to profit or loss. Why, why, how about the 5,8 itself? Where do we put it? Remember, we said we shall pay it after two years. So if end of first year, it's now 5,8, it means you are only left with one year to pay. So what do you do? This then becomes a current liability. A current liability in the consolidated statement of financial position statement of financial position so the closing balance in the in the in the in the in the contingent consideration is a current liability if it is to be paid within 12 months from from that date in the in the in this consolidated statement of financial position so all these are elements of consideration transfer so you do notice here that consideration transferred includes fair value of contingent consideration at acquisition. Now, this is another question that you, you, you need to ask yourself and say, say, are you not seeing that contingent consideration increased from 5 to 5,8? Does it mean if we calculate goodwill, we need to retrospectively adjust our goodwill? No. 
Goodwill is only calculated with the fair value of contingent consideration at acquisition. If the fair value changes, these are now subsequent measurement issues. They don't warrant retrospective adjustment of our goodwill estimate at acquisition. All right? Continuing. Present value of deferred consideration. So deferred consideration is also a part of consideration transferred, meaning it is part of amount that we pay to obtain a controlling interest in a subsidiary. We call this deferred consideration. Now you may say, say, what is the difference between contingent consideration and deferred consideration? Now, the difference between the two is contingent consideration, you set a condition. Deferred consideration, you don't set a con condition, but you simply say, I will pay after a particular period. I repeat, contingent consideration is conditional consideration. It has got this element of if, if. But deferred consideration, it's a matter of saying, I will pay 10 million after five years. Simple as that. So suppose the, the con so all these are elements of consideration transferred. If there is cash and a deferred consideration, you add again. You add the deferred consideration. So let me say, uh, acquisition consisted also, I mean, uh, consideration transferred consisted consisted also of a deferred consideration of 50 million of 50 million payable uh, payable uh, at the end of the second year at the end of second year. Now pay attention to this. Then you are told that the company's cost of capital, the firm's, the firm's cost of capital, the firm's cost of capital is 10%. I want you to, to see how we navigate it. Remember in, in your handout, your say said present value. So if you are going to pay 50 million at the end of second year and you are calculating goodwill today, you, you can't say the consideration transferred is 50 million. No. You need to find its value today. So what do you do? You say, you then say PV. So this is, this is at acquisition. At acquisition, what do you do? At acquisition, you say PV of deferred consideration. And then you open bracket and say 50 million times 50 million times 1, 1 to the power minus 2. Because this is to be paid after two years. So the PV equals 50 times 1, 1 because 10% is the cost of capital to the power minus 2. If it was after three years, you'd, you'd, you'd do to the power minus three. So this is what you do at acquisition. So this is the con this is the consideration transferred. You, you say PV of deferred consideration. Now, let us do, let us say end, uh, end of first year. End of first year. How do you proceed end of first year? Because you are yet to pay this, because you said you shall pay it after second year, end of second year. So end of first year, you say, what it means is present value is 41,32, but it is going to increase by interest of 10% to 50 million come year two. So what you do then, you say, unwinding the discount. The process that you do is called unwinding. You have to unwind the discount. How do you unwind the discount? You, you, you are now acknowledging the fact that this 41, which is present value, is going to compound to 50 million by end of year two. So it is increasing with interest every year. So you say year one finance cost 
A1 finance, finance cost. So this is again shown in the consolidated statement of profit or loss, consolidated statement of profit or loss. So it will be 10%, 10% multiplied by 41,32. You close bracket. So you say equals 0.1 times that. So we are we have unwound the discount for the first year. So after unwinding the discount, I add the two figures here. What what happens now to the closing balance? Because it is increasing. It will be 50 million end of year two. So it is increasing by the interest. And this interest is the finance cost. So this one goes to consolidated statement of PL. What about the closing balance? The closing balance becomes a current liability. This one is a current, current liability. Liability in consolidated statement of financial position. Now you may say, say, in what way is it a current liability? It's a current liability because remember, this is a con this is deferred consideration. In other words, we have promised to pay after two years. So it's a liability. Now that end of first year, we are you are only left with 12 months. So you can't say it's a non-current thing. No, it's a current. Right? And, and then, what about year two? End of year two. Uh, in year two, in year two, what you do is you, you say unwinding the discount. You unwind the discount again and say year two finance cost. Year two finance cost. To finance cost. So again, notice it's now 10% of 45,45. It's no longer 10% of uh, of 41. No, you are unwinding the discount. So you're saying equals 0.1 multiply by this. So this is year two finance cost. And then you add you add up the two, like this one and this one, and what you get becomes 50. So this this one becomes fifty. So what you do is this one the, the finance cost goes to consolidated profit or loss. Oh sorry guys, please mute. May you mute whenever you realize that you have got background noises, please mute. Actually, you guys have an obligation to you have an obligation to help me mute your colleagues here when you realize that I'm explaining and you are, are you not seeing how you can find uh, where background noise is coming from? If you can check here, you see everyone is muted, but you are hearing background noises. You click here where there are your other two colleagues. You check here who is not muted. Only don't mute your say. Otherwise, if you mute your say, you may ask who is my say among the my Your say is Atlantic resources. So don't mute your say. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Okay. So continuing. Continuing. So there you go. So are you not seeing that by the end of year two, it's now fifty million. So it was present value was forty one comma thirty two. That was the. This is the amount you recognize it acquisition. You don't recognize fifty million. It will increase to fifty million by finance cost. So this one you then credit bank. For the end of year two, you credit bank and you pay it. That's that's credit bank. So what you then happen because you you, you what then happens you now, you are now paying. So you debit, you debit deferred consideration, the liability, and then and then you credit credit bank when you pay it off. Simple as that. Okay, continuing. What I'm discussing with you are the elements of consideration transferred. The elements that make up consideration transferred. So issues like another element is debt issued by the parent in exchange of shares. You know, the, the parent may, may, may acquire subsidiary by paying cash, but you may also acquire subsidiary by, <laughs> you may also acquire subsidiary by not paying cash. Uh, without without sounding masculine, you know, you guys, you understand what I'm going to say now. 
Imagine you are paying Lobola. You do you know that you can you can you can actually pay cash, or you can pay half cash and half you then say, can you just give me a list? I will sort the issue later. So when you you in the, the analog is not exact, but it helps you to understand what I want to say. You can acquire a subsidiary by not paying, in other words, by issuing debt securities. So if you say, I want to pay, but I, I, I don't have cash now, it, it, it might be contingent consideration or deferred consideration. Or you can escalate it to say, look, shareholders of the target must give up their shares there and take up loans in my company. In other words, you are saying, I want to acquire that company, but on this condition, give up your shares and take up loans or loan notes in this company. So we, are, we say you are issuing debt securities as part of consideration transfer. So there is an exchange ratio. You may say 20 shares for every $100 loan note that I issue. So effectively speaking, if I acquire a subsidiary by issuing shares, what I'm actually doing is I am increasing my loan notes. These guys are, be, are coming here to become loan note holders. So what is going to happen is my liabilities are going to increase. My long-term lo debt is going to increase because I am now issuing additional debt to those guys to say, give up your equity stake there so that I become the owner in, and in exchange, you take up the debt securities here that I'm issuing. So I am now increasing my obligation to pay interest. So there will be finance cost on debt issued. So let me summarize it. If you issue debt securities in an exchange of shares, what you're actually doing is you are increasing your debt. So in other words, your finance cost burden increases. Your non-current liability in the consolidated statement of financial position increases. You get that. So that's that's this is this is another issue. And then last but not least on consideration transferred is the issue of any is the issue of any fair value of PPE transferred by the parent as part of acquisition. No, you know this one. This one is 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 uncommon, but it it, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. No, it, it's it's only uncommon. You can pay cash to acquire a company, but is it if you can pay cash, you say credit bank because you have paid cash. You may pay. You may transfer property to acquire a company. You can transfer land. You can transfer building to acquire a company. So notice, suppose Atlantic Resources is acquiring a company and we don't have cash, but we want to, we have, we have, we have an, a, a property, PPE with a carrying amount, PPE with a carrying amount of 5 million. We do have PPE with a carrying amount of 5 million. And then we want to pay for the acquisition, but we want to pay using this PPE. So what it then means is uh, we have to find the fair value of this PPE. So we need to say, we pay, remember, suppose it's building. We can't say we pay you with building at its carrying amount. No, we find the fair value. Suppose the fair value of the building at this date is $8 million. So what it means is consideration transferred is not 5 it's 8 according to this handout that I prepared. I say the fair value of PPE transferred by the parent is part of acquisition or is part of consideration. So here, fair value is 8 million. So effectively speaking, notice, effectively speaking, you have disposed your PPE. So as a parent, as at length, after transferring PPE with a carrying amount of 5 million, and a fair value of 8 million. So what we then have to do, we acknowledge that we have disposed. So we say consideration transferred, consideration transferred for this particular PPE, consideration transferred, it will be 8 million. And then you then, you then credit 
you using uh, PPE because effectively speaking, you have sold it. You credit it by five, and then you credit again consolidated profit or loss. Cons consolidated profit or loss, you credit with three. And the, why this three? Because the three is basically the three basically becomes profit on disposal of PP. This is profit on disposal of PPE. Get it? Right. By con by consideration transferred, you shall notice we actually we actually referring to like goodwill. I, I shall sh show you shortly. But I I, I, I I just avoided to say goodwill here because because you you may not you are yet to to cover that with me. So everything I've been explaining is what is then given in these notes. Now consideration transferred number two. I mean co co I mean consolidation guidelines number two is goodwill. The first one was to find how much we paid to acquire. The second now is goodwill. You know goodwill arises whenever you pay more than the fair value of net assets at acquisition. Whenever your consideration transferred exceeds the fair value of net assets at, at acquisition, we say there's goodwill. So what is how, how is goodwill calculated? Goodwill is calculated as the difference between. Notice this is how you calculate goodwill. Okay, is that a question? You you are free to ask a question and can you go over the last? Can you go over the last consideration? Okay, uh, Stanji, you are saying I, I, I go over the last co consideration transferred, which is on PPE. I suppose that's what you are referring to. Now, um, you, you know, you can pay for something using PPE. It's, it's possible, Stanji, that you owe me, let, let's say you owe me 20,000. You can pay me 20,000 using your car. It's, it's possible. You can pay me the 20,000 using your car. But so if I accept your car, I am saying the fair value of the car is 20,000. That's what I'm doing because you owe me 20,000. I can say you can pay me using your car. So you are saying fair value of the car is 20,000. But effectively speaking, in your books, you have disposed the car because its carrying amount was not 20. In your books, suppose its carrying amount was 15. So you, you have to credit PPE from your books, 15, to remove the car. And you also have to credit 5,000 to your profit or loss because you have sold the car at a value which is above its PPE. So I'm sure that helps. Then continuing. Um, we, we we are now on 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 guideline number guideline number two, which is goodwill. How you calculate goodwill is simply difference between the sum. That's how goodwill is calculated. Difference between the sum of uh, be, between the sum of consideration transferred and value of NCI less subsidiary identifiable net assets at acquisition date. In other words. The, the, the subsidiaries net assets at acquisition date are to be valued at their fair value. You subtract the amount you pay from the fair value of assets that you assumed. The difference is goodwill. Now, when you are calculating net assets clearly, net assets simply mean, you know, we do have the accounting equation, and I'm sure you, you understand this particular accounting equation. Accounting equation says assets equals capital plus liabilities that's O plus let's say assets equals equity plus <laughs> liabilities let let us use the word equity now you do notice that if you say assets assets minus liabilities you get what is called equity so clearly assets minus liabilities can be termed as net assets equals equity so when we are referring to net assets, what you are actually referring to is equity. You are referring to share capital and reserves. No wonder why we say, here we say less fair value of subsidiaries, net assets, but 
instead of getting net assets, we are, we are saying share capital, retained earnings, reserves. It follows from this particular accounting equation, which says net assets or assets minus liabilities should give you equity. So if you want to find net assets of a subsidiary, just look at its equity components at acquisition debt. Key thing, at acquisition debt, meaning if you are not given at acquisition debt, you have to calculate and come up with values at acquisition debt. So you now have this. Um, you now have these share capital retained earnings. You now understand that they make up net assets. And then there's this element, this line here, which is fair value adjustments. Let me briefly explain about that. You know, when you acquire a subsidiary, there's an element of some of the assets in the subsidiary's books might have carrying amounts which are not equal to their fair values. So, if you acquire at length, let's, let, let's say the asset that I only have is the laptop I'm using. In my books, this laptop might have a carrying amount of $50. After I've depreciated it and everything, the carrying amount for this laptop might be just $50. So if you are to acquire at length resources, you can't reasonably expect that I give you the laptop at $50. No. What I do is, I do what is called fair value adjustment. I undertake what is called fair value uh, adjustment or due diligence. So, so, so I tell you that, oh, oh, my friend, my the fair value of my laptop is actually two seventy. I can say the fair value of my laptop is sixty five. Let me just increase slightly. So, when you are calculating goodwill. Asset, share capital and retained earnings, share capital and reserves, these, they just consist of carrying amounts of assets. So the carrying amount, if it's different from fair value now, I then have to increase the carrying amounts with the fair value adjustment. In this case, I have to put the additional 15. I don't put 65 here. I put 15. Because the, the 50 is already in the carrying amounts, which is shake up to and retain the earnings and reserves. And the 15 is the adjustment I'm making to bring it to 55, to 65, sorry. So that's, 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 that's the significance of fair value adjustment. In this case, it was a fair value adjustment upwards. It can actually be a fair value adjustment downwards. Suppose I fair value it to 40. At acquisition, I'm saying my laptop has got a carrying amount of 50, but you as the acquirer, you say, oh, no, this laptop, I can, I, you can't be sold even at 50. So the only amount you can sell it for is just 40. So what, I, what you then have to do, you carry out fair value adjustment downwards. So when you're calculating goodwill, the share capital and reserves, this part here, this is carrying amount. This is the 50. But you know that you acquired it yet with a fair value of 40. So you then have to put minus 10 here. Minus 10 here. It might be possible that also at the date of acquisition, you realize that this company is a liability which it is not, which it is not recognized in its own books. Suppose at the date of acquisition, you have a, a, an issue with, which is at the courts. And chances are you are likely to lose 15 million from that issue which is at the courts, but you don't have the 15 million as a provision in your books. So if I'm calculating goodwill, I if I say share capital and retained earnings, all I have is the net assets, the carrying amount of your assets in your books, but the 15 million, which is a court case, which you are likely to use and to lose, and the provision for 15 million need to be made. It means I have to reduce your assets by a fair value adjustment of court case. And I'll put minus 15 here to get your net assets. After getting this, after doing this, I then come up with, with my goodwill. But, uh, but allow me to, to, to mention something before I, go, I, I come to that. So it means, suppose it was a fair value adjustment downwards, I mean upwards, which which which... Suppose it was a fair value adjustment upwards, which I had, I had, I had done earlier, like I said is 65. What it means is, if you as, a, as the acquirer, you are now 
you you are now recording this asset in your books you don't record the asset at 50 you record it at 65 so what it means is, is if i'm consolidating my accounts with that of a subsidiary i would say if i'm now consolidating ppe i would say ppe equals i would say my ppe as a parent which is peace i would say ppe of the subsidiary which is s's and then i would then say plus fair value adjustment because i did not acquire the asset at carrying amount but i acquired, I acquired it at fair value so i would say plus 15 because I increased the asset by 15, it means I then have to depreciate the 15. The 15, is, it was an additional asset that I assumed at acquisition. So it means I then have to depreciate it. So I say minus depreciation on fair value adjustment. You get it? Because it was a fair value adjustment upwards. If it was a fair value adjustment downwards, I would do the same, but I would just change the sign. If it was a downward, I would say my asset plus subsidiary minus, minus the fair value adjustment, which was the downward adjustment. Then instead of saying less depreciation on fair value adjustment, I would say plus depreciation on fair value adjustment because it, it was a downward adjustment. Okay. Um, I'm just explaining stuff here which is so pertinent and so important. Now, housekeeping. If, if you calculate good and it comes out positive, it becomes an intangible asset in the consolidated statement of financial position. The good that comes out here, it's accounted for as an intangible asset in the consolidated statement of financial position. And goodwill is not amortized or depreciated. You don't amortize goodwill. But rather, you periodically test it for impairment in accordance with IAS 36, impairment of assets. In other words, you periodically test whether its carrying amount is equal, is, is equal to the recoverable amount. If you realize that it is carried at a higher value than what it should be, you then have to impair it. In other words, to reduce the carrying amount of goodwill. When you, are, when you are impairing goodwill, what you are actually acknowledging is circumstances and events. Okay, so question, would, would the asset not be at fair value at the date of acquisition? How then are we depreciating it? Ah, well, well, uh, I, let, me, let me take it, let me try to interpret it for you try to interpret it for you uh, for now let me put question marks you tell me whether i've interpreted it right you know what if you acquire a company you acquire a company as a going concern make sure you understand that part when you acquire atlas resources you acquire us as a going concern so what it means is our assets have got their carrying amounts in our books so I, I gave you the example of a laptop, and I said the laptop in our books is at 50, not at fair value. We don't record laptops at fair value. You record it at 50. That's the carrying amount of the laptop. But if you acquire at length, you, will, you do what is called fair value adjustment, and you realize that the fair value is 65. So what it means is, if Atlens is depreciating this laptop, it will continue to depreciate it at 50. But you being the acquirer, the cost of the laptop to you being the acquirer for consolidation purposes was 65. So you take the depreciated cost for Atlens, which we had depreciated from 50, but you acquired the laptop at 65. In other words, the additional 15, you still have to depreciate it over the remaining useful life of the laptop from the date of acquisition over the remaining useful life of the laptop from the date of acquisition. I'm sure, I'm sure I've explained that part. You, you just notify me whether I've explained that part on that question mark issue. All right. Uh, sorry, you know. As you see, uh, always have a lot of issues here. Uh, 
Okay, so perfect. Now you you need to feel free to ask questions. Otherwise, it 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 ceases to be interactive. You know, you need to ensure that the Skype lecture is different from reading a book. If what you were if what you were to do when you are reading the book is the same way you do it in a Skype class then you are not maximizing the most out of it. And you don't think that I will, I, I will be offended in any way by you asking questions. I, that, that's, 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 not, that's, not, that's not your say. Now, okay, let me remove the, this fun, funny stuff which is popping up. So what was I saying? I was saying goodwill arising at acquisition is not amortized. What does it mean? You don't depreciate goodwill. Rather, you periodically test it for impairment to check if it is not carried at a higher value than what you can recover. So whenever you realize that, suppose you, you recognize the good of 20 million and you realize that that company was involved in a scandal so that there is no more good to, to write home about and what you can only recover of the 20 is 13 million good view. In other words, you have to reduce that good view from 20 to 13. We say you have recognized the impairment loss on good view. And that one is a non cash out item. So what do you do? You credit good view and debit profit or loss. By profit or loss, I mean consolidated profit or loss with that particular 7 million. What if goodwill is negative? If goodwill is negative, notice, it means you paid less than the assets. That's what it means. For, uh, for this answer here to be negative, what you paid here at the top is less than the assets that you assumed. So it's like you were given discount, so to speak. It's like you were given discount. So in proper terminology, you say you bargained. You were able to bargain. No wonder why negative goodwill is, is known as a bargain purchase and is credited to profit or loss as other income because technically speaking it's like a it's like a discount because you paid less for the assets now why we carry out fair value adjustments i've told you that fair value adjustments are carried out to an, you as the acquirer don't just buy assets at their carrying amounts otherwise you may overpay for the assets and the danger of overpaying for the assets is that you erode the shareholder wealth. If you are acquiring athletes, don't just pay the assets in the statement of financial position. Rather, you carry out what is called due diligence to identify whether the carrying amounts are actually they are actually you know resembling their their fair values. If not, do fair value adjustments. But you may say. Say, talk to us on this one because we need to, to zero it in into something practical. Today, I acquire Atlant resources and am I supposed to do fair value adjustments today? You know, there are instances where you may, you may not have sufficient time to carry out fair value adjustments. So IFRS 3, which is the standard on business combination, recognizes that fact. That on the date at the date of acquisition, you may not have all the relevant facts to satisfy yourself that these amounts are fair values. So IFRS 3 sets out what is called measurement period. Please pay attention to that. IFRS 3 has got what is called a measurement period of up to 12 months, of up to 12 months from the date of acquisition. Within this period, you as the acquirer, you can assess how reasonable are the way the assumptions used to come up with fair values at acquisition date. You, you, can, you, you can carry out due, due diligence to say, mm, was that building really at 24 million? So you can proceed with the acquisition, but the standard gives you 12 months period from the date of acquisition where you can review the assumptions that you, you, you used to come up with fair values at acquisition. So now you may say, say, now that I suppose I, at acquisition the building was 24 million, but after, after reviewing the assumptions and carrying out due diligence, I realized that it wasn't, it was, it wasn't 24, it was 20. So what do I do? Under the circumstances, you calculate your goodwill in two phases. You first calculate what we call draft goodwill at acquisition using fair values that you had at acquisition. 
Then if a new information is obtained within the measurement period, meaning within the 12 months from acquisition, and you happen to come up with new information, what you do is you retrospectively adjust your good you estimate or your good you that you have estimated its acquisition. Normally, this provision is utilized when there is a negative goodwill, especially when there is negative goodwill to say your goodwill is negative here. It means you paid less than the assets. So chances are the assets were overvalued. So you as the acquirer, when a negative goodwill arises, when there's a bargain purchase, don't just rush to say, oh, it's other income, because chances are your assets were overvalued. So what you do is you have to carry out fair value at you review in the, within the measurement period. If you obtain any new information, you come back to the good you estimated it acquisition and retrospectively adjust it. And, and you still remember how we calculate fair values? Please play the previous video. The fair value is computed in accordance with IFRS. 18, which is the standard on fair value measurements. We discussed that in detail. Just the previous video, we have this. If you don't have it, you visit on, on, on you visit my YouTube account. I'm sure everyone in this class should subscribe to that account because we post videos there. And I really appreciate if you make if you subscribe to that account. All right. So so this is this is what I'm saying that uh, I three three sets the measurement period of twelve months. Actually, it should be of up to twelve months from acquisition date. Of up to twelve months. Within this period, the acquirer can assess the reasonability of the assumptions used in determining fair values at acquisition date. If new information is obtained during the measurement period, the amount used to estimate good or above will be retrospectively adjusted by relevant journal entries affecting good you calculated it acquisition date so that's 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 so important there are two main methods of calculating goodwill there are two main methods of calculating goodwill there is full goodwill method and there is partial goodwill method now i i i i, I allow me just perhaps to open a question but we are not this time this time we are not answering anything we are not answering anything. It's it, it's just for for me to just to to I I know I know whenever I open a question, there is you you enter into an amplified state of reasoning and understanding, doing a lot of things. Now this is this is um, September December 2019. You do notice uh, in the previous lecture. Remember we did this this part in the last week's video, the seven marks here. We discussed that. And then in this particular, notice the second part is saying, a draft, an, draft an explanatory note to directors of Laploid addressing the following. How fair value of the factory should have been determined at 1 July and why the depreciated replacement cost of 17,4 is unlikely to be a reasonable estimate of fair value. I discussed this with you in the previous lecture. Make sure you play that. And then... Uh, a calculation of goodwill arising on acquisition of Kalisan measuring the NCI at fair value at proportionate share of net assets. So this is, they want a calculation of goodwill, but using fair value method or using proportionate share method. So these are the things that you need not to get wrong because these are the building blocks of your SBR. The group financial statement is something that you really have to know. So, if I come to this now, uh, to this handout here, it's you it, it telling us that there are two main methods of accounting for goodwill. It's it's important for you to notice that good the formula for calculating goodwill is like this. It's the same consideration transferred at fair value of NCI less. So a fair value of subsidiaries identifiable net assets. But now, how you how you really really come up with the fair value of NCI or the value of NCI? It, it, it that's what gives us these two methods of accounting for goodwill. There is what is called full goodwill method. 
Full goodwill method, it simply means goodwill arising at acquisition is owned by both parent and NCI. Full means you, you have two parties. You may say, say, what is NCI? NCI means non-controlling interest. So if I, if I acquire 80%, 20% is NCI. So if I'm calculating goodwill using full goodwill method, it means after calculating good, this good rate acquisition, which 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 I have which have which I have identified here, this good rate, both the parent and NCI have a share in this good rate. Now, if parent and NCI have a share in this good rate, suppose this good rate is subsequently depreciated. I mean, is subsequently um, uh, impaired. Let's say it was 20 and then it was impaired by 7. Meaning we reduce the value of good by 7. It means both NCI and the parent will have their share of the impairment loss. So that's what we are having here. Using this method, good arising at acquisition is owned by both parent and NCI. Any subsequent impairment of good is apportioned between parent and NCI. With this method, the group's policy is to, would be to measure NCI at fair value. I like this part. The examiner normally doesn't tell you to say full good. The examiner normally just says, assuming that good is measured, at, I mean, assuming that NCI is measured at fair value. Once you have the phrase, the NCI is being measured at fair value, it means the group is using full good method. It means both parent and NCI have a share in goodwill. It means if that goodwill is subsequently impaired, the impairment loss on goodwill is apportioned between parent and NCI. So, so this is what the examiner is saying. Assuming that calculate, uh, NCI is being measured at fair value. So in, a, in, in your question, they might then cancel fair value and use the term full goodwill. It's still the same. So what do we mean by fair value? Fair value, it simply means if you are calculating goodwill here, where you come, when you come to the line here, which is saying NCI, you just multiply number of shares belonging to NCI. So if you acquire 80% of 20,000, it means NCI is 20% 20 of 20,000. And then you multiply by the share price to get fair value of NCI. Simple as that. But not the share price of the parent, but the share price of the target of the subsidiary. Because NCI, these are shares which we did which we did not acquire. So they are valued using the share price of the subsidiary, not share price of the of the parent. Uh, so no wonder why, if you come to a question like this, I'm not going to read it. Otherwise, I may I'm, we are still to cover quite a lot. Notice, it's saying discuss the calculation and allocation of Kalisan impairment loss at 30 June 20x8 and why the impairment loss of Kalisan would differ depending on how NCI non-controlling interests are measured. Your answer should include a calculation and an explanation of how impairments would impact upon consolidated statements of financial, consolidated financial statements of Kalisan. So you can see here, these are now SBR questions. SBR questions are about explanation. You are explaining to directors. So what you have to do is, you, it's a method of saying, when you are using full good method, that's where the 11 marks are. But of course, there is, there is an element of cash generating unit, which we shall discuss later on, not now, which is equally part of the answer there. No, uh, when you are using full good method, we are saying, Impairment loss on goodwill is apportioned between parent and NCI. So they both get a share. And in the consolidated statement of financial position, you debit retained earnings. You, you, deb, you, you, you act with impairment, you debit NCI, debit retained earnings, and credit goodwill. But of course, uh, in this particular question, impairment loss is being asked here were impairment loss for a cash generating unit. And because it was a cash generating unit, it equally has goodwill. So we shall discuss the other nitty gritties of this. Don't say this is the full answer to that question. No, I'm just trying to illustrate to you what full goodwill method is. 
And then let us go to partial good method. Partial good method is what is it arises when NCI notice. Let me let me let me have it step by step. With what when they say partial, they are saying one party owns goodwill. That's where partial is. When they say full goodwill, they are saying both parties own goodwill. Partial, one party, we have got parent and NCI, these are the parties. One party owns goodwill. So goodwill is partially owned. That's why we call it partial goodwill method. So with this method, goodwill arising at acquisition is owned by the parent only. Meaning only the parent owns goodwill. You get that? It means if this goodwill is subsequently impaired, any the impairment loss is borne by the parent only. You don't apportion impairment loss between parent and NCI if NCI doesn't own goodwill. No wonder why this question was saying, discuss how impairments would differ if depending on how NCI is measured. This is what, and they are saying discuss, meaning you are going to take what I am saying here verbatim in answering this particular question. So with partial goodwill method, if goodwill is subsequently impaired, impairment loss is borne by the parent only. It's borne by the parent only. Now, how do you know that this is partial goodwill method? Because the examiner may not actually use the word partial. How then do you know that this is partial goodwill method? You look at the wording of the question. The question would say, if NCI is valued at proportionate share of net assets. So what it means is, with partial goodwill method, it's an issue of saying, notice, with this method, the group's policy would be to measure NCI at acquisition at its proportionate share of subsidiaries identifiable net assets. That is the policy if you are using partial goodwill method. You are going to measure NCI at its proportionate share of the subsidiaries identifiable net assets. So it is, it is conventionally referred to as proportionate share of net assets. But, but, but you may say, say, can you turn it down and spice it up for us so that we can break it up, break it out in a manner that is understandable? Sure. Because you would say, say, this is your formula template for calculating goodwill. And I am using full goodwill method. How do I go about it? It's simple. If you are using full goodwill method, the fair value of NCI will be given. So this is not a train smash. You just come here and say fair value of NCI, you put the figure. If it's given as a, a per, per share, you multiply by the number of NCI shares, you get the figure. Now, if now we are using partial goodwill method, the statement is saying, notice, even from the exam, NCI is being measured as proportionate share of net assets. What does it mean is, if you are using partial goodwill method, you leave your NCI line here blank first. You leave it blank first and you come to your net assets. After coming to your net assets and you find your net assets here being, say, 100, and NCI was 20%, and they are saying NCI is a proportionate share of net assets. So when you are now using partial goodwill method, you first find NCI, I mean net assets, to be 100, and NCI is a proportion of that 100. So you then come back to your NCI line, which you had left blank, and say 20% of 100. Hi, right, guys. Please mute. Please, please mute. Perfect. Thanks. Are you getting what I'm saying? Let me repeat. NCI measured it as a proportionate share of net assets. Simple stuff. What do I do say? First, leave NCI line blank because it is a share of net assets. So what you have to do, proceed with this template and get net assets. After getting net assets, then multiply NCI's share or percentage by the net assets to put the figure for NCI here and proceed with your good deal calculation. Okay. So these are the two main methods of calculating goodwill. So this is exactly what I've said here that First, find net assets. 
of the subsidiary and then multiply by NCI percentage to get the fair value of net assets. <clears throat> and then we now have unrealized profits in inventory or in assets. You know, these are the nitty gritties, the basic consolidation mechanics. You know, the group is, is treated as a single reporting entity. The group is treated as a single reporting entity. So what it means is, so a group is like a family. If you sell goods to your spouse and the goods are still within the family at reporting date, suppose you sold goods to your spouse at a profit and the goods are still within the family at reporting date, clearly the profit is yet to be realized by the family because the family is treated as a single entity. So the fact that wife or husband sold goods to each other at a profit and the goods are still within the family at reporting date, that profit is called unrealized. You need to debit your retained earnings with that profit and credit inventory with that profit because the profit is still included in that inventory. And, you know, if you, are if you, if you want to figure out how much... How much is profit? How much is what? Uh, when you sell goods with, with, with it to each other within the group, you need to have knowledge of markup and margin. I'm sure you, you still have that knowledge. If you are told that these goods were sold at a markup of, you need to navigate your way to say, if I'm given selling price, do I use markup or I use margin? If, I, if I'm given cost of sales, I use markup. So if they say markup was 25% and you are told that they were sold for 100, you then have to convert your markup into margin because the 100 is the selling price. You don't multiply markup to a selling price. Rather, you multiply margin to a selling price. Now, how, how do you convert markup of 25% to a margin? It's simply 25 over 125. Markup of 100% to a margin, it's 100 over 200. Simple as that. That is knowledge which I which is assumed. I expect you to know that. Continuing. Continuing. Uh, consolidated retained earnings. Uh, now you are. These are like you are now aggregating. How do you aggregate retained earnings of the parent and a subsidiary? Now, when I say parent and subsidiary, if you are given names. You don't continue writing parent and subsidiary. So if the parent is old mutual and subsidiary is econet, make sure you say old mutual econet here. This is how you come up with retained earnings to, to, to present in the statement of financial position. You say balance at reporting date, meaning the retained earnings that you are given by the examiner at that date. What do you do next? You then say less retained earnings at acquisition. The reason why you take out this is because the retained earnings which you found at acquisition doesn't belong to you as the acquirer. It belongs to the former owners who you paid off. The retained earnings at acquisition does not belong to you because they were earned by previous owners. So, so you have that. No wonder why we take it out. Notice retained earnings at acquisition is subtracted from the subsidiary. And then you say less depreciation on fair value adjustments. As I have said, if it, if it is in upward or if it is downward, you add it. Meaning this sign here might be negative if it was a fair value adjustment upwards or positive if it was a fair value adjustment downwards. So you would say less depreciation on fair value adjustments. Remember, depreciation on fair value adjustments only arise if the fair value adjustments in question were, were assets. There are instances where you, you fair value a debt you, 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 you don't depreciate a loan or a liability, no. Then less unrealized profit. Now, unrealized profit is deducted from the books of the seller, not of the buyer. So if, if it's the parent to the subsidiary, which is a downstream activity, if it's a parent to subsidiary, unrealized profit is deducted from the results of the parent. If it's from a subsidiary to the parent, you subtract from the results of the subsidiary. No wonder why we say all oh, here. Now, you tally up the, the subsidiary section here. You tally it up. And once you tally it up, what you get here is called post-acquisition. This figure here, which I have highlighted in dark yellow. 
This is called post acquisition retained earnings. This is the post acquisition. So if you own the subsidiary 100%, it means this whole amount here belongs to you as the parent. This whole amount here will belong to you as the parent. But it is rare normally for a company to own another 100%. The other portion is owned by NCI. So what you do is you take your group share. So if you own the subsidiary 80%, it means you take 80% of this figure here and put it here. That will be group share. 20% of the same figure belongs to NCI. That's not your share. And then as I have said here, bargain purchase it's accounted for as other income. So it, 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 it is credited to retained earnings. And when you are crediting something, you are adding it up. No wonder why it's added here. Then share of the associate is post acquisition retained earnings. If you have got an associate here and it makes profits and you have a share of that, that's where you put it there. It is also included in retained earnings. Then decrease or increase in fair value of contingent consideration. You now understand what I said earlier. Then interest on deferred consideration, you now understand what I was saying when I was saying you unwind the discount. When I was talking of unwinding the discount, this is the interest that I'm referring to here. It's actually finance cost. Then impairment of the associate or goodwill, meaning you do, you, as you shall notice shortly, associate can also be impaired, even goodwill can also be impaired. So if there's an impairment of goodwill, that's where you put it here. But notice, if the group uses full goodwill method, it means it means impairment on goodwill is apportioned between NCI and parent. So if, if it was a full goodwill method, you only take parent's share of the impairment of goodwill. But if the group uses partial goodwill method, meaning goodwill is owned by the parent only, it means impairment here that you, have, that you put here will be the full impairment. Then dividend declared by the parent. Now, concerning dividend, you just take the parent only. And then finance cost on bonds issued at acquisition, ETC, as the, as the occasions prevail, then you have consolidated retained earnings. That's the figure you then record in the statement of financial position. And now the carrying amount of NCI. Remember, you still need to, de to determine the carrying amount of NCI for the purpose of consolidation. It's an easy stuff. When calculating the carrying amount of NCI, all you simply do is you say fair value at acquisition. Now, the value of NCI at acquisition is basically the value that is in good working. This value, when you are saying value of NCI, this working, this figure here, is the value we are talking about here. So, as I said, it means if 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 you if you if you care, if you utilize the provisions of measurement period and you come up with new information, which I said within 12 months, and you have to retrospectively adjust your goodwill. If you come up with new information during the measurement period, you can still revert and correct the value of NCI as well, especially if NCI is measured at proportionate share of net assets. Because remember, I said measurement period allows you to check if net assets if the fair value of net assets were reasonable. So if NCI was measured as a proportionate share of fair value of net assets, and then during the measurement period, you happen to find new information concerning those net assets, it means your NCI also will be affected because it was based on those net assets. And then you say add NCI's share of subsidiaries post acquisition reserves, in other words, here, where we said group share is 80% of this figure, it means 20% goes to NCI here. Less dividend paid to NCI if, if, if it is given, that's where you put it here. Less NCI's share of good impairment. This is only relevant if the group uses full good method only. If, if it's partial good method, don't worry. Then carrying amount of the investment in associate, a reporting debt, you, 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 again, you are being required to understand what I said an associate is. An associate is an investee in which we own between 20 to 49% of the voting shares. Under the circumstances, we are 
as we are said to have assumed significant influence. We are said to have assumed significant influence. Now, concerning the associate, it's important because the associate, we, because we don't control it, it means we don't consolidate it. Like, we don't aggregate it. We don't say assets. We don't say assets of the parent plus assets of the subsidiary plus assets of the associate. No. We don't do it that way. So an associate then is equity accounted. It's not consolidated. It's equity accounted because it's, it's not part of a group. Actually, an associate is called a related party. It is, a, it is recognized as a related party in accordance with IAS 24, related parties. Remember, we mentioned that in the previous week's discussion, that there is need for disclosure on such things. Now, in the consolidated statement of financial position, how then do we acknowledge our investment in an associate? What we do, we equity account the investment in an associate. You may say, say, what do you mean? Yes, what I mean. Equity accounting. So, so basically, the investment in an, in an associate is equity accounted. What does this mean? It means you initially recognize the associated cost, meaning the amount you paid to acquire the shares. If you pay 20% of shares in Econet, the amount you paid to acquire those shares, that is called cost of the associate. Now, at each reporting date, because an associate is, is like, it's an asset that you have acquired. At each report, but you, you purchased this in the form of shares. So at each reporting date, the carrying amount of the investment in associate is tested for impairment. And, and, and you adjust with the dividends received from the associate and any share of the post-acquisition reserves made by the associate. So let me say you acquire 100 shares from from Old Mutual. Let's say you acquire 100 shares from Old Mutual. And for whatever, uh, let's say you acquire 20% from Old Mutual and Old Mutual following that acquisition becomes your associate. So what you do is you say cost of the associate, so you have it here. Yeah. But remember, what you acquired were shares. So because you acquired shares, remember, you, you receive dividends from that. So if you receive dividends, it's like you are getting a return on your investment. So you subtract the dividends there. And if old mutual generates profit, it means 20% of the profit belongs to you because you acquired 20%. So you put it here. And suppose old mutual is involved in an issue which requires you to test it for impairment. In other words, suppose there are events and circumstances which cause the value of your investment in old mutual to four you have to test it for impairment and then what you then do is you reduce the carrying amount you reduce the carrying amount by any resultant impairment loss you get it right so what i've what i've uh i have this the how i have i have actually taken you through groups so far is the part that I was discussing is the part that we normally think or know that you have carried it up from your F7, from your FR, meaning the junior course to SBR. We expect you to get this on board. But real, recognizing that some of you, you did FRIS back, some of you were exempted, some of you, you have your own fears. So as you say, I take you through as if nothing has happened. Can you imagine? I begin to... I started by even explaining to you what an associate is. Knowing perfectly well, you know that. So I, 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 you, you need to understand that when I begin to give you an assignment, I know that I would have explained everything without saying this, I assumed you know, no. So, so, so continuing, aggregation guidelines. What is to aggregate? Remember, when you are saying consolidating, you are adding. To consolidate basically is to add, but you don't. You just don't add anyhow. You add within the framework of approved additions. This, this, these are the guidelines I was giving you my, before now. So if you are now preparing consolidated statement of profit or loss, here is how you go about it. What you do is containing revenue. You say revenue for the parent plus revenue for the subsidiary 
less intergroup sales. So intergroup sales are not considered as revenue. You have to take them out. Then cost of sales. Cost of sales, what you do is you, con you consider parent is cost of sales plus subsidiary cost of sales minus intergroup sales. Are you not seeing intergroup sales are deducted from revenue and are also deducted from cost of sales? The reason is to the other company, it's a sale. To the receiving company, it's a cost of sale, the same amount. So no wonder why we deducted them from sales and we equally deducted them from cost of sales. And then plus unrealized profit. Then you get, uh, you get gross profit. And then other income. You now know. When, you, when, when it comes to other income, you now have other income of the parent, that's P, other income of the subsidiary. And then you now have bargain purchase, it's other income. You now know that if there is a decrease in fair value of contingent consideration, it's treated as other income. And then expenses. Expenses, you say P plus S, less any intergroup expenses. Meaning, if a, if a parent charges management fees to the subsidiary, that's not expenses for the group because the amount is just circulating within the group. So you need to make sure that intergroup expenses are, 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 are deducted. Then finance cost. Remember, finance cost on deferred consideration. Remember that which we're referring to as unwinding the discount. And if there was any debt issue, debt acquisition, interest on such debt issue, debt acquisition, it's additional finance cost. And then share of the profit of the associate, make sure you take it after tax. And then income tax expense, P plus S, and then you have got profit for the year. But notice, at no point have we added for the associate to say sales, parent plus subsidiary plus, plus associate. Cost of sales, we haven't said plus associate. Associate, we only take our share of profit. This is what we refer to as equity accounting. You only take your share of profit of the associate. Right. Then there's another expense. There's another expense which is commonly examined, but I have not talked about it. So let me spice it up with that. You may say, say, what if when I'm arranging the acquisition, they I seek legal advice? Suppose you are busy arranging for the acquisition and you hire lawyers. You know, you can't consummate the process of acquiring a company on your own. It is the it, steps and procedures involved are so demanding. You make use of expertise and they charge you legal advice or any. That amount is not part of consideration transferred. It's an expense. You can't say you want to acquire Atlas and I am the shareholder here. And you want to pay me. And in the process, you hire a lawyer. In your books, you can't say I paid Atlas the amount, this amount plus the amount I hired the lawyers. No. Those were not part of the consideration transfer. That was an expense you paid to consummate this thing. So it, make sure that in, in other instances, you are given questions where they say the company paid legal fees of $5 million to acquire this particular company. And then the question is, draft an explanatory note to the directors of the company, explaining to them how good we should have been calculated. As part of your explanation is to tell directors that legal fees paid in arranging or negotiating for this acquisition is not part of consideration transferred and is expensed to profit or loss. You now know by profit or loss what I mean. By profit or loss, at every point, I'm referring to consolidated profit or loss. All right. <clears throat> so you know now another thing on 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 uh, on statement of profit or loss, consolidated statement of profit. Another thing that I want to mention is there are instances where you acquire subsidiary during the current financial year. During the current financial year. So if the year end is 31 December, oh, sorry. If the year end is 31 December, for example, and you acquire subsidiary in, on 1 September, it means this company was only a subsidiary for September, October, November, December. It was just a subsidiary for four months. So when you are consolidating, like you are saying, sales, 
you don't say revenue, parent plus subsidiary, and you take the full amount of the subsidiary. No, the subsidiary's revenue and expense items will be time apportioned. Because it was subsidiary for four months. So if you are given annual revenue for the subsidiary, take four over 12 of it. Expenses for the subsidiary take four over 12 of them. This only happens if the subsidiary is acquired during the current financial year. And notice what you time a portion is for the subsidiary only. For the parent, there's no need to time a portion because you are the one who is consolidating. So you can't begin to time a portion your own figures as well. Can you imagine? All right. So continuing. Consolidated statement of profit or financial position, aggregation guidelines. This is now like how then you bring the pieces together and present in a manner which is which is meant for the for the users. So property plant and equipment, I told you, you say P plus S plus any fair value adjustment, less depreciation on fair value adjustment. You now know this. And then goodwill. Goodwill. Uh, Goodwill is as per the working that we have done, less any impairment. That is, if there's any impairment. Other intangible assets, P plus S plus fair value adjustments, less any amortization. But I want you to notice something. There is goodwill here and there is other intangible assets. This tells you that goodwill is not lump. We don't lump goodwill together with, any, with other assets. No. Goodwill is treated separately. With other assets, it's not just lumped together with other assets. No, it's it's separate. It's separately treated. And then we have investments. Now on this, under this, it's like e.g. investment in associate. Suppose you have any an associate. So the carrying amount for the investment in associate that we have calculated under guideline number six here, this carrying amount is then included. That's where you put it investment so investment in associate that's where the figure is then current assets these are housekeeping issues current assets remember to say p plus s if there's any inventory in transit add that up less unrealized profit if there's any because unrealized profit is included in inventory because you sold goods at a profit to a company within the group and these goods are still within the group so it means they still contain that profit element. So remember to take that out. Receivables, P plus S less intra-group debts, also known as current accounts. Now, intra-group debts, it's like intercompany OIMs for companies within the same group. So if you owe money to your to your if you owe money to your to your spouse, for example, clearly it's not it's not a, a debt for the family but i know i know i know i know ladies have a different take you know if i owe my wife money i don't necessarily take it as debt because i consolidate <laughs> but i don't know what i mean if she if if if, if I, I mean if 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 i mean if she owes me money that's what i wanted to put it if she owes me money normally i just Consider it to be non, it to be to be to be a non obligation because I consolidate. But if I owe him money, I don't know. I don't know what happens with ladies. Uh, I I I need to sponsor a discourse at a different forum. You have to tell me why is it if your hubby owes you money, you recall that. So from now on, consider a family as a single reporting entity. When, and when money is owed by your husband, just ignore, just ignore and move on with your life. It's, 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 it's quite cool that way. Okay. The, you know, the, the analog is not exact, but it tells you that we treat the group as a single entity. So if they are intercompany or borrowings and you are now treating this as a single entity, it doesn't really, it doesn't really make sense that intercompany borrowing. Bank and or cash and cash equivalent, so you do the same. And then notice on equity, equity is P only. For share capital, you take share capital of P only, but you then have to adjust that share capital if there, if there is any unrecorded shares issued in exchange. You now appreciate that if you acquire a company by share exchange, as I have showed you in, in, in our earlier discussions, 
that clearly how you account for the consideration in the form of share exchange is like this. The par value will increase the parent is share capital. And the excess of par value of fair value over par value goes to share premium. But you only, I said this transaction, you only do it if the examiner specifically says the consideration is yet to be recorded. If, if the examiner says the parent is already recorded, it means that those entries have been done. No wonder why I'm saying plus any par value of unrecorded, unrecorded, that's the key thing. It's not always done unless the examiner tells you that the consideration is yet to be recorded. And then retained earnings as per the working and then other components of equity. Remember to add share premium on, sh on shares issued in exchange as we discussed in the introductory remarks. NCI as per NCI working. And then if, if you go to the liability section, remember to include loans issued at acquisition. Any provisions recognized at acquisition. If they were recognized at, at present value, Remember to unwind the interest. You now know that if you unwind the interest, you debit profit or loss as an expense, but it increases the liability. So no wonder why we are saying plus interest unwound. Then payables, remember to, 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 to subtract intercompany debts or the current accounts, tax uh, P plus S, and then recognize now that there are other liabilities like deferred consideration, and if it's deferred consideration, what you record in the books, I said, you say present value at acquisition plus interest unwound or finance cost unwound. So in the statement of financial position, we don't put the value that was there at acquisition, no. We add interest unwound to the reporting debt, up to the reporting debt, and then the balance now at the year end. No wonder why I emphasize end of, end of. Meaning in the statement of financial position, you don't put what was its acquisition because its acquisition is not end of. End of, you then have to increase with interest unwound in the interim. So in, even in the end out, I emphasized that part. No wonder why reporting deadline here is, is in bold. Okay. So complex groups. Uh, we are, we are, uh, we are, I'm about to wrap it up, don't worry. Complex groups. Now, complex. When we are saying complex group, don't 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 think that we are saying it's now difficult. No, complexity of the group simply refers to the group architecture, meaning group structure. That's what we mean by complex group. It simply means group structure. But ordinary consolidation guidelines that I've given above, they still apply, and that is more comforting. The same consolidation guidelines I was giving you, they apply. Now, it's, take for example, a, a company is not, now has two subsidiaries. It's, not, it's now a complex group. A simple group is one subsidiary. But the manner you consolidate one subsidiary is the same way you are going to consolidate two subsidiaries. Where we were saying S, P plus S plus. You are now saying P plus S1, subsidiary 1, plus subsidiary 2, plus subsidiary 3, but in exams we limit to maximum of subsidiary, two subsidiaries. So everything we're doing, they just add, add additional subsidiary and we proceed with everything we say. If it was goodwill for subsidiary 1, goodwill for subsidiary 2, and you now have two goodwills. <laughs> There's something of that nature. Okay. Now this is this is uh, how you the consolidation uh, mechanics when we are talking of complex groups. Now notice, notice there is what is called vertical group. Vertical group is when a company acquires a subsidiary and a subsidiary proceeds to acquire as well. A company acquires a subsidiary like P acquires S and then S proceeds to acquire SS. Now, pay, pay attention to, to what I'm going to say now. It means of the three companies, only one should prepare consolidated financial statements. In this case, it's P. So, relative to P, SS is known as a sub-subsidiary. 
sub subsidiary because it is indirectly owned through S. So if P is consolidating SS, suppose you are being asked what percentage does P own SS? You don't say P owns SS 60%. No. Interest of P in SS is not 60%. But rather, because the P owns S 80% and then S in turn owns 60% of SS, it means P owns SS 80% of the 60%. So it's important to understand the effective interest. So how, how do you navigate a situation like this? You ask yourself, which company must consolidate? We agree it's P. And what is P's interest in S? Obvious. P's interest in S is 80%. So when you are dealing with S, we say 80% for group share, NCI, 20%. But when we are dealing with SS, we don't say NCI is 40% in SS. No, because 40% is for S, not for P. The company which is consolidating is P. So P owns SS 80% of CGST. So P owns SS 48%. Now you may say, say, now that P owns SS 48%, does that make SS a, an associate? No. It doesn't make SS an associate because even though we own it 48%, it's just effective interest, meaning it's a paper adjustment. But the substance of the transaction is we control SS through S. If we are in P, we control. As long as control still stands, it's a subsidiary. So in this case, you now have a situation where if we are consolidating SS, Retained earnings for SS, we take 48%. 52% goes to NCI. But when you are consolidating S, you just consider 80% and 20% is your NCI. Now, let's say we are calculating consideration transferred in SS. We are at good working and want to calculate how much did P pay to acquire SS Remember, P did not make a direct investment in SS. Rather, the investment was made through S indirectly. So, under the circumstances, if we want to know how much did P paid to acquire SS, you simply say amount paid by S, you multiply that amount by 80%. That would be the consideration P has in SS. Because P deals whatever S does. P is 80% on it. So if S paid 100 million to acquire SS, and then P is the one which is calculating goodwill in SS, P will not say 100 million, but rather P will take 80% of 100 million, and then the goodwill working will be as before. But consideration transferred in SS will be 80% of what S paid. So this is what I've, I've, I've written here that. P's consideration in SS is simply 80% of the amount paid by S. And what and where, where does the other 20% go? It reduces the NCI in S. The other 20% reduces the NCI in S. We call that an indirect interest adjustment. Right? Uh, I know you have the video. Because you have the video, you don't play it once and say, say, I've understood it. No. You have to play it over and over until it makes sense. Then another, another complex structure is D-shape. D-shape, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's like P acquires S and S proceeded to acquire SS. And also P has got its own direct interest in SS. So this time P acquired 10% directly in SS and the rest indirectly through S. So if you are asked a simple question, what is P's interest in SS? Because P is the one which is consolidating. So we need to know what is its NCI in SS. You can't say it's 25%. No. You say P acquired 10% direct, which is this curved line here. 10% direct, which is your 10%. And then P is also an indirect interest meaning 80% or 75%, that's 60. 
So the total of PC stake in SS is 70%. So if you want to, if you want now to know what what percentage of post acquisition reserves of SS do we take? You take 70%. Because it is P which is consolidating, it's not S. And then what is our NCI in SS? It's not 25%, it's 30%. Then, if you now want to know how much did P paid to acquire SS, that becomes a simple thing. You say the direct interest, meaning how much did it pay directly like this? The amount paid for the 10% was so much. And then the amount paid indirectly it was 80% of whatever S paid. So you have consideration transferred in SS. And then you proceed to prepare consolidated statement of financial position or to calculate your goodwill and stuff. You know, that's all you need to know on complex groups notice. It's already done. So, so as you can see, I have put a, 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 an illustration, uh, an, an NBA, and I said, Regardless of the group structure, a single working for goodwill, a single working for retained earnings, and a single working for NCI must be made. In other words, if we had two columns for retained earnings when we had one subsidiary, we now need four, we now need three columns because there's additional subsidiary. If we had two columns for goodwill with one subsidiary, we now need four columns for good working with the two subsidiaries. The first two for the other subsidiary, the other two for the other subsidiary. Now, what, what you all have to pay attention is when you are saying consideration transferred, for S, it's a straightforward thing. But for the next subsidiary, under the circumstances, you then say amount paid for the 10% and then the indirect one, which was 80% of what S paid. And then the 20% reduces NCI in S. Meaning when you're calculating NCI in S, the 20% of what is left here reduces NCI in S. It is called an indirect interest adjustment. Right. So that's done. I'm about to wrap it up. I already I'm now on page number six. Remember, we are we are we are any we are we are getting to the end. So just hang in there. Uh, the, you need everything explained. And I know this one, a single video would be like overwhelming to you. So you still have this video and you have to play it again to understand it. Not once, twice to understand it. So I will give you illustrative questions. And the illustrative questions on this one will be in the form of a video of mine again that I have already prepared. I, I need to take the bulk of it explaining the guidelines so that you would notice in the video, I'll be saying, as I said last week, as I said last week, by last week, I'll be referring to this. So on Monday, we'll be doing something else like consolidating, consolidating foreign operations. That is what we'll be discussing on Monday. So we, we are already moving. We are already moving. Consolidating foreign operations. Those are very interesting topics. We need to wrap this up in one and a half months sharp and then... We spent the whole month of August revising. So that's, you know, we have a very tremendous pass rate that we maintain. And, and you need to move with your say because the pass rate is awesome. They take, for example, the previous sitting, what, when was that? Was it the December? 28 students wrote SBR in our class and 25 passed. So clearly we don't even move by what you call global averages and stuff. We move by at length pass rate. And you need to ensure that when by joining this class, you have a commitment to be very serious and to study. I'm sure your colleagues who I have taken from FRA, they appreciate and they understand really what I'm talking about. So pretty soon, you'd notice from the program of study that I gave you, I will be giving you assignments. The assignments will be on CBE practice platform, meaning they are on a platform which mimics the CBE environment so that we will start right away on the go on the go don't be shy to type can you imagine your say the end out i've given you i typed it myself you can see it's not a copy and paste end out i was the one typing i gave you the notes i typed man the notes in excess of 200 pages i and i have all these end outs typed again and i'm illustrating typing again 
why I do this? You know, I could have just have slides showing you a slide move, one with a slide move. The reason I want you to develop a culture of typing. If it's difficult, ask my say does it easily. I'm explaining something by typing where I can just fold the edge and begin to explain without typing anything. I could do that, that deferred consideration, you do it like this, like this, without even typing. Why I do this is I am considering you to be directors. And you sh I showed you the questions. The questions are always draft an explanatory note to directors. So the way I would like you to answer the examiner is the way I must teach you. If I, if, I, if I type what the standard says first, before I apply to the figures, this is what you must do. You don't just, if, this, if the question says, draft an explanatory note to directors, which shows how good we should have been calculated. That question is not just saying calculate good. Clearly, it's not saying that. It's saying draft an explanatory note explain how good you should have been calculated. So you are explaining the calculation of good in words. To say good is calculated as the difference between the sum of consideration transferred plus fair value of NCI less the fair value of subsidiary is identifiable net assets at acquisition date. If the fair values are, if the fair value, if the carrying amounts of net assets are different from the fair values, the acquirer undertakes fair value adjustments. IFRS 3 sets out a measurement period of 12 months from acquisition date within which the acquirer can, pay, can you know, investigate the reasonability of the assumptions that we used at acquisition. If any new information is obtained during this period, the goodwill estimated acquisition is retrospectively adjusted. You are done. Then you say, applying these guidelines, this is how goodwill should have been calculated. And you now have your seven marks. And like a situation where right away you are beginning to calculate consideration transferred, you ask yourself, can I present this to board members? Remember, you are being required to draft an explanatory note to the board. Now, if it's an explanatory note to the board and what we get from you right away is consideration transferred. And, and I'm a board, I'm, a, I'm an operations director. I don't even have an idea what consideration transferred is. And you, that's what you just did and submitted for marking. If I have never taught you like that, why are you writing an exam like that? You ask yourself that question. So you have an obligation to maintain because we want we 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 have we have what is called the progression ratio, progression ratio of at least at, at most three years. Progression ratio of meaning we can start with a student and finish the course it at most three years. Meaning others are completing it in the in in the interim. So you have to stick. To those results because once you register and you are under atlens already you are being monitored progressively under atlens so you need not to escalate it to four years when we have set a ceiling of three years as, as the standard to take the student through okay so don't worry i'll i'll, I'll send video for with explanations on everything but that video now has got plenty of past exam questions you can still get it from program of study if you don't have it let me know, I'll send it to you. Now, step acquisitions of subsidiaries. So clearly the, the name says it all. You don't pay it once, but rather you acquire subsidiary in stages. You may acquire 10% now, and then you acquire another 30% to make it 40, and then you acquire another 20% to make it a subsidiary. So clearly, this one is not a train smash. If you acquire 40%, it's an associate. So it's, there's, no, there's nothing, there's no big deal. During the interim period, you account for it as an associate, meaning you equit account it for the associate as we detailed be, uh, earlier. And then when you, when you now increase it from 40% to take it to 70%, meaning you buy additional 30% at that juncture, it's now a subsidiary because you now obtain control. So business combination starts. So from the day you increase your interest to cross the 50% threshold, meaning to obtain control, you calculate good view on that date. You calculate good view on that date. But let me tone it down for you to understand it so that it, it doesn't really it doesn't really give you much of a challenge. 
such a transaction where you had 40 percent and now you you now have you buy you buy additional 30 and you take it to 70 percent is called a swap and top transaction you 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 normally you normally have a swap and top isn't it in in our social commercial intercourses i'm sure you we always have swap and top transaction like i have i have i have i have a, 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 an earlier version of the phone. I now need another one. I can swap it. I can, I can give the dealer the phone and talk with some money and I get the brand new thing. This is this is exactly what we are talking about. So please, uh, whenever you have background noises, mute. All right. So let us discuss with you, say, swap and top transaction. Because I need you to understand a swap and top transaction. Please pay attention. From an associate to a subsidiary. From an associate. From an associate to a subsidiary. From an associate to a subsidiary. Now, uh, to a subsidiary. I don't know where I'm getting the echo of spellings here, but uh, you know, as an account, we are we are accountants. We are not into all this. Now, from an associate to a subsidiary. Notice, I want to use this analog. I want to use this analog that uh, that the associate the associate is iPhone. Uh, the associate is like iPhone iPhone, um, iPhone 6, I don't know the what, whatever they call them, S6 or whatever, let's say iPhone 6, and the carrying amount for iPhone for the associate in your books, after you equity account it, the iPhone 6 is $600. And then, subsidiary, subsidiary, Subsidiary is iPhone 12. iPhone 12. This is your subsidiary. Uh, it is a uh, it is a fair value. Meaning now in the shop, you are yet to buy it. Fair value of the the subsidiary is a fair value of 1,440. Now. You want to upgrade from an associate to a subsidiary. This is exactly what this arrow means. From an associate to a subsidiary. From 40% to over 50% category. Once you cross this 50% threshold, we call it accounting boundary line. It means the previously held interest need to be remeasured. You need to remeasure it. But let, let me, let me, I will come to this, but let me explain in, in a language you understand. If you need iPhone 12 from a dealer and you have got iPhone 6, what you do, what you do is, I get to a dealer and say, I need, I have my iPhone 6 here. I need iPhone 12. What, 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 what do you think the dealer would do? The, do you think the dealer would request for the carrying amount of my iPhone 6? Talk to yourself. You can type in the chat. If I get to a dealer with my iPhone 6 and I need iPhone 12, which is trading at 1440, what would the dealer do to my iPhone 6? Talk to me. You can make use of chat feature or unmute and talk to me. Do you think the dealer would do you think the dealer would say what is the carrying amount in your books of iPhone 6? Expect someone to be typing here. Right. Okay. Matthew is typing. It's a wonder because this question is all that you need on that transaction. So I'm not going to rush over it. That's all you need on that particular transaction. And my the question is, do you think the dealer will do due diligence to and ascertain its fair value. Good. If I get to the dealer with iPhone 6, 
the, and I need iPhone 12, the dealer will say, what is the fair value of iPhone 6? Will not say what is the carrying amount of iPhone 6 in your books. So, so, pay attention now. When you are calculating goodwill in a situation where it was an associate and now it's a subsidiary, what you do is, what you do is, if someone then asks you, suppose you then buy a subsidiary like this, you then buy the subsidiary, and you come to me and I say, how, what was your purchase consideration for the subsidiary? Clearly, you don't say it was 440. If I say break it down for me, you then say consideration transferred. Consideration transferred. Consideration transferred. If I ask you a simple question, what was your consideration transferred? You then say amount paid to acquire 30%. Amount, amount paid... Oh, so associate was, uh, let me put percentages. Associate was 40%. Subsidiary is now 70%. Meaning I, I, I added, I added the, I added the 30%. So if I'm now asked, how much did I pay for this iPhone 12, which is my subsidiary? I say amount paid to, amount paid for additional 30%. For additional 30%. And then, please pay attention. I say additional 30%, I paid 840. And then I say, uh, ah, let's, let's say the, the, uh, the iPhone, the iPhone, the, the iPhone 6 had a fair value of 500. 500. The dealer says, oh, the iPhone 6 has a fair value of 500. So I want to swap in top to buy iPhone 12, which is my subsidiary. So I say amount paid to to top it up was was it's not it's not it's not 800, but I say it's 1440 minus 500. So I topped 940, and then I say add add a value of previously held interest, previously held yield interest now the previously held interest is the iphone is the iphone 6 which is the associate so fair value of previously held interest 500 so if you meet me along the way i would then say this was my consideration transferred i then say this was my consideration transferred remember i'm calculating goodwill and then i say add value of NCI, I, I uh, okay, I add fair value of NCI. Sorry, it has to, it has to be next line. And so this one is, this one was supposed to be. I, I had to put, I put the wrong, uh, the wrong thing here. I, I, I was supposed to first tally them up like this, and then the line I put it here. And then add fair value of NCI, I then put XXX. And then I proceed to say less fair value of net assets. Less fair value of net assets. Less fair value of net assets. Now, notice. Notice. If I get to the cell phone vendor and say I need iPhone 6, the cell phone vendor does not ask me. I, I mean, I say I need iPhone 12. The cell phone vendor does not ask me, how much did you buy your iPhone 6? No. Meaning, the cost that you paid to acquire the associate is of no use. When you increase from 40% to 30%, the amount you paid to acquire the 40% is of no use. The iPhone 6, what we need for the iPhone 6 is just its fair value because this is a swap and top transaction. So the vendor just says, your iPhone 6 is a fair value of 500, and my iPhone 12 is 1440. So can you pay additional for 940 cash? And once you are done, this is your consideration transferred for the subsidiary. Amount paid for additional interest. 
a the fair value of previously held interest, not at the cost of the previously held interest. The amount you purchased your iPhone 6 for is of no use to the cell phone vendor. Can you just type noted on that account on that on that point alone? I, I, will, I will explain further. I just want you a feedback on that. Uh, type it if you are getting it. Can you just type noted noted? Or I just need a feedback on that one because it's so important going forward. All right. Okay. So you guys, you guys are perfect. I I I I already have my feedback. That's what I wanted. So, so, so what are you saying noted for? You are saying noted for the fact that if I am increasing from an associate to a subsidiary, the cost that I paid for my associate does not matter when I'm calculating consideration transferred. Rather, if I consider the subsidiary is iPhone 12 and the associate is iPhone 6 and on the date of purchase I am with the cell phone vendor, the cell phone vendor simply asks me how much I pay. Uh, what uh, the cell phone vendor simply asks me the fair value of the associate of iPhone six, and then he will then say if the fair value is five hundred and my iPhone twelve is fourteen forty, can you top it up by paying additional nine forty? And then you proceed with your good calculation. That is point number one. Point number two, which is which is which I'm illustrating in an area shaded in blue. A, in, in an area shaded in blue is, are you not seeing that there's, a, a, there's another transaction which is actually taking place? Oh, let me not shade it in blue. Let me shade it in yellow so that you can see clearly. There is another transaction which is taking place also. Are you not seeing that your iPhone 6, effectively speaking, you have sold it? Effectively speaking, your iPhone 6, you have sold it. So what we then have to do is, if I get to a cell phone vendor with my iPhone 6, I say, I, I have an iPhone 6, I need iPhone 12. And the vendor said, the fair value of iPhone 6 is 500. Effectively speaking, I have disposed my iPhone 6. So what I need to do is to calculate profit or loss on disposal. Now, if I then say iPhone 6 is an associate, I then have to calculate gain or loss on de-recognition of the associate. Some call it a step acquisition adjustment. So I then have to calculate gain, gain or loss on de-recognition. Gain or loss on de-recognition of, of the associate. And, and as I've said, some call it a step acquisition adjustment. A step acquisition adjustment right a step acquisition adjustment so this one is so important a step acquisition adjustment so how do you calculate this acquisition i got to the cell phone vendor with my iphone 6 and the cell phone vendor said its fair value is 500 but its carrying amount was 600 so effectively speaking i say fair value fair value at at, 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 at that date where, uh, where I assumed control, fair value was 500 and carrying amount of the associate, carrying amount was 600. So what do I do? I have a loss. Uh, I have a loss. That's loss on deal cognition. This loss on deal cognition goes to the loss on deal cognition then goes to consolidated profit or loss. Consolidated profit or loss. If you are not preparing profit or loss, we simply mean retained earnings. Whenever we, we, wherever we are saying it goes to profit or loss, if you are not asked to prepare profit or loss, it goes to retained earnings. That's what it means. Anything that goes to profit or loss, if the examiner has not asked you to prepare profit or loss, it means adjust it direct to retained earnings, meaning make an adjustment directly in equity oh so you can't you you never you never have it explained this way you know this these are the issues which 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 give which your colleagues say sba it's, it's a bit difficult but notice as you say i just grasped grasped it that way and notice how 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 you are actually understanding it uh, to, to 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 
beyond measure. So this is what I want you to, to, to really, really appreciate, the step acquisition adjustment. So already I'm done with, uh, with step acquisition. So you can see here, from in, uh, an investment in associate becomes a subsidiary. This is like swap and top transaction. Please, when you are playing this video on YouTube, uh, I would appreciate, you know, YouTube has got a playback feature. When you are playing it, and you realize that I'm, I'm now responding, you, you would rather play it back and get a grasp of what I was saying, and then you do it like this. You then come to this and say, a subsidiary becomes an associate. We are now using proper language now, not swap and talk. Then, since control has been gained, because you have now crossed the accounting boundary line, which is the 50% threshold, there is need for fair value measurement of previously held interest and to calculate goodwill. There is need, because you, they, because you have obtained control, so there's business combination. And when there's business combination, there's need to calculate goodwill. So when you are calculating goodwill, in this case, the previously held interest is deemed to have been sold and reacquired at fair value. The previously held interest is assumed to have been sold and reacquired at fair value. That's the swap and top transaction. You had your iPhone 6 and you now brought it included in iPhone 12. Because you now have 70, it means the 40 is included in the 70. So if you want to say how much have you paid for the 70, we don't care what you paid for the 40. All we need to know is how much, what was the fair value of the 40 when you increased your interest. So in an example, you shall be given that the associate had a cost of. You know, the examiner will be given you trying to trick you because when you are calculating goodwill, you now say, oh, well, now that we have 70%, how much did we pay? So for the associate, we paid so much. And for the 30%, we paid this much. Yet I'm telling you that in a swap and top transaction, the cell phone vendor will not ask you how much you paid for your iPhone 6. The cell phone vendor will simply say, what is the fair value of iPhone 6? It's so much. Then add additional cash of so much. This is exactly what has happened here. Okay, so clearly this is now how good you is calculated. Now you understand this part now. And then the associate now, which is your iPhone 6, it's as good as it has been sold. Your iPhone 6 has been sold, effectively speaking. So you need to calculate gain or loss on deal cognition of your iPhone 6, which is the associate. So you say the fair value which the vendor said it is less the carrying amount of that associate in your books. If the carrying amount is not given, you now know how to calculate the carrying amount of the associate. I said it is equity accounted, meaning cost plus share of post acquisition reserves less in payment ETC that we have alluded to earlier. Right. Now, in the, in the consolidated statement of, of profit or loss, you consolidate from the day you cross the accounting boundary line. You don't consolidate from the day you acquired the associate. Meaning, when you are dealing with your iPhone 12, you now consolidate from the date you purchased the iPhone 12, not from the date you purchased the iPhone 6, because iPhone 6 was an associate. In the statement of financial position, you consolidate because financial position is prepared as at end of the year. Now, as at end of the year, you already had your subsidiary. You now have your iPhone 6. Now, another... Another step acquisition is from a subsidiary to a subsidiary. Meaning, you are increasing a previously held controlling interest. Are we together? From a subsidiary to a subsidiary. What does that mean? You are increasing a previously held controlling interest. Meaning, you already had iPhone 6, but suppose you want to put a pouch. <laughs> <laughs> you want to put some uh, apps in your iPhone 6, and I mean in your iPhone 12. You now have your iPhone 12, which is a subsidiary, and you want to put some pouch to the iPhone 12. You don't call that swap and top. You get to a cell phone vendor with iPhone 12, and you just want to put some pouch to it. The cell phone vendor will not say, what is the fair value of iPhone? No. 
The cell phone vendor will simply say, the pouch costs so much. But still, if you are asking someone outside, you simply say, I still have my iPhone 12. So in this way, you still, you had control, you still have control, so there's no need to calculate goodwill. Because goodwill was calculated when you initially obtained control. So if you have 70% stake and you now want to increase it to 80%, you don't calculate another goodwill to bring it to 80 No. Because goodwill is not calculated because of, of, of what every good is calculated when you obtained control. So when you acquired 70, you had control and you calculated good and that was it. Now that you want to increase from 70 to 80, this doesn't warrant additional calculation of good because it is still a subsidian. So there's no change. And so there's no need for fair value remeasurement of the previously held interest. It's like you, there's nothing like you, it was an associate and it's now a subsidiary. So you can't say an associate was disposed. In this case, it was a subsidiary. It is still a subsidiary. So there is no fair value remeasurement of the previously held interest. So what, what, the, what is it that you do? When you had 70% when you stake, it means NCI was state. Now that you have 80% stake, NCI is now 20 so this transaction is called the transaction between owners. What, what, what you have just done is you have bought NCI. You, you were at 70, now you are at 8. NCI was at 30, now it's at 20. So you just assumed assets which belonged to NCI and paid them some cash for that. So what you then have to do, you calculate what is called an adjustment to parent equity. That's all you have to calculate. You just adjust your equity from 70 where it was. It's now at 80. So you compute an equity adjustment. That's all that is required. You don't even recalculate goodwill. No, because it was still a sub, it was a subsidiary and it still is a subsidiary. So you perform an adjustment to, to parent this equity, and this is how it is calculated. So it's as simple as that. Ad adjustment to parent this equity. Notice. Notice what happened. You increased your interest from 70 to 80, meaning you paid, you purchased 10% of NCI. So you say amount paid to increase the interest. That's the amount you pay. But so what is happening is you purchased what belonged to NCI. So you you gave NCI some cash and then you took their assets. So you, you gave NCI cash and you are now taking assets which belonged to NCI. If, if, if NCI had a share in Gudu, you are also taking that share of Gudu which belonged to, to NCI for that 10% only. So that is as easy as that. You just say cash paid less decrease in NCI in net assets, meaning assets which belonged to NCI. The portion of the 10% you took, that's what we are talking about, the decrease of NCI. NCI was at 30, now it's at 20. The 10% is what we are referring to in their net assets. Well, you know what it means at this line? It means you need to find NCI balance first. And then from the NCI balance, take out the 10% that you have purchased. So if NCI balance is not given, you first need to calculate the NCI balance and then extract the decrease of 10%. That's what we are saying here. Then a decrease in NCI in Goodwill, then adjustment to parent is equity. So this is an equity adjustment. It goes with its sign. If it is positive, it means you paid less. You paid less than the assets you got. So it means your equity increased. If it is negative, it means you paid more to the NCI for the 10% than the assets you got. So your equity decreased. So this adjustment is credited to retained earnings. In other instances, it is credited to other components of equity. So at this line, let me repeat what I said. When we are saying NCI will decrease, what it means is the procedure is, the procedure for this line is what is written in this NB. It is advisable to first obtain carrying amount of NCI at transaction date in order to determine the decrease or, or, or increase. 
So let's say, let's say NCI at this date, let me scroll down here with, on my Excel. Let's say after calculating NCI at this date, I found NCI, remember NCI, my NCI was 30%. I, and their carrying amount, I, I calculate carrying amount of NCI and I get the NCI to be 260. These are millions. NCI is 216 million. And then after undertaking this transaction of increasing my interest from 70 to say to 8, NCI decreases from 20 from 30 to 20. So if I'm saying decrease in NCI in net assets, what I'm simply saying is you then come here and say decrease in NCI in net assets. Assets. It, it will be 10 because it's 10 percent. It decreased by 10 percent over 30 percent because these ones were 30 percent. 30 percent NCI was 216. So if I decrease by 10 percent, I'm saying 10 percent over 30 percent. So I simply say equals minus. Uh, 10 over 30 times this. Right. So NCI decreased by 72. The 72 is what I am going to put here. I'm sure it's now clear what I mean. So in most, in most exams, this figure, the carrying amount of NCI at the date you, you purchased the 10%, this carrying amount will not be there. So what you have to do is to first determine the carrying amount of NCI. If it is not there, you then have to calculate it using the guidelines I gave you earlier for NCI. This guideline here for NCI. Uh, here. If it, you need to find the NCI value up to the date of that particular transaction, which is this one. And then this one becomes your 216 here. And then if the transaction decreased the NCI by 10%, you then do this to find decrease in NCI. Then this decrease in NCI, you compare this with the amount that was paid. You compare this with the amount that was paid, which is, which is this, to find equity adjustment. Simple as that. Okay. So, guys, uh, I, I, I implore on you just to increase today's lecture by just 15 minutes. You know, it, 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 it doesn't really make sense. Uh, it doesn't really make sense to leave the last item. Yeah, or even to say, now go and delete on the last item. Otherwise, I'll be taking a very huge risk. Allow, allow me to finish it up. It, 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 it is important if I have it on record so that you, you play it in our, um, you then play it in the, on our YouTube stream. It will be streamed and we'll send you the link. So it's not a it's not it's not a big deal, don't worry. All right. Okay. Group disposals. Now uh, you know the reason we dispose is because we acquire to create value. You know, as a finance manager, as a as 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 a as a manager who 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 is an expert in financial reporting and all these matters, you need to ensure, remember, we, uh, by the grace of God, I may teach you financial management. Financial management tells us that if the acquisition fails to create value, suppose we are now experiencing diseconomies of scale due to a lot of growth. We are now experiencing quite a lot of hurdles. Uh, one of the turnaround strategies is to dispose your subsidiary, your portfolio, you know, your portfolio you need to reconstitute your portfolio reconstitution or may require you to dispose some acquire some and or even to reduce to, to reduce what if it was a subsidiary to scale it down to an associate it's possible and then use the amount that you have received from selling your interest to pursue other profitable ventures we are teaching you this in sbl but let us now do the financial reporting aspect of it when you when you dispose it's natural that when you are disposing your investment in a subsidiary, it was your investment, so there's need to calculate gain or loss. Yeah, because it is a carrying amount, because it was an investment, there's a carrying amount vis-a-vis -vis the amount you got when you sold. So there's an, an element of gain or loss. Another thing is, from the debt you disposed, depending on whether, if, if it was a full disposal, 
from the debt you dispose going forward, you don't consolidate. From the debt you dispose going forward, because you, you consolidated when there was a business combination. And now that after disposal, you lost control. So there is no more business combination. So you don't consolidate. But if you dispose and the remaining interest is still a subsidiary, like from you disposed from 90, you now have a 60. It means it is still a subsidiary because you still have control. So continue to consolidate. But if you dispose from 90 and you are left with 40%, meaning it's now an associate, meaning going forward from this debt going forward, don't consolidate the associate. Don't consolidate the associate because it's now an associate. So you consolidate up to, up to, if, if it was one, one September, up to 31 August. From 31 August, now it's an associate, you equit account the associate going forward. Are you together? This is the long and short of it. So let me give you now the nitty gritties of it. So if you dispose from a subsidiary to an associate, it's now a climb down from iPhone 12 to iPhone 6. So the line of thinking is now in inverse. It's now, you, 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 you are now coming from iPhone 12 to iPhone 6 because you have lost control. I shall come to the iPhone climb downs later. Let me take you through this. So you can actually dispose a subsidiary like this. Uh, so either way, notice, whenever you lose control, there is need for fair value remeasurement of the previously held interest. There is need for fair value remeasurement. It's like I had my iPhone 12, but I need some cash. So I go to the vendor, you know, if I had if I had an iPhone 12, I need some cash in the iPhone 6. What do I do? I go to the cell phone vendor. I tell the guy and say, look, I have an iPhone 12, but I need cash and another phone on this. Meaning I need to dispose and retain some interest. So the interest that I retain can be an associate or can still make me a subsidiary, meaning I still have control. So what the cell phone vendor will do to me if I have that a transaction? It's no longer a swap and top. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the reverse of swap and top. Can it be swap and down? <laughs> I'm just joking on that part. But you know, you understand what I'm saying. The cell phone vendor will say, "Look, your iPhone 12." I say, "This is my iPhone 12." And then the cell phone vendor will say, "Look, the fair value of this." Not the fair value of his iPhone 12, but the fair value of this iPhone 12 I've brought is 1,000. Now, you are saying you need iPhone 6. I say yes. Then the cell phone vendor will say, iPhone 6 is trading at 600, and this one is 1,000. So the cell phone vendor will give me iPhone 6 and 400 cash. So if I then meet you along the way and, I, and you tell me, tell me how... How, what was your consideration received? This time it's no longer consideration paid. I would say consideration received is I got 400 cash and the fair value of the remaining interest, meaning iPhone 6, which is 600, totaling to 1,000, which was the fair value of iPhone 12. I gave you the analog. So let me, let me explain it. In, in the from this oh okay so you can see these arrows the arrow which we want to concentrate our attention on is this arrow where you cross the 50 you cross the 50 again so it's a, this one is like from a subsidiary to just a financial asset this one is from a subsidiary to an associate so these are the disposals that we have now notice there are two companies there are two reporting uh, uh, reporting issues here. Before financial statements are consolidated, they are known as separate financial statements. When they are consolidated, they are known as group financial statements. So there is separate financial statements and there is group financial statements. Separate financial statements and group financial statements. So pay attention now to this one. 
<coughs> so whenever control is lost, we calculate group gain or loss on disposal as follows. So I told you that you sold your iPhone 12 and you are, you, you are given cash with some iPhone 6. And then we ask you, how much did you sell your iPhone 12 for? You say, my iPhone 12, I sold it like this. I was given 400 cash, which is your 400 yen. And then the iPhone 6, which is the remaining interest, meaning the associate, you then say, add fair value of the remaining interest. This might be associate or even 10% or what, as long as there's remaining interest, if any. You add the fair value. So I was given 400 cash here and the iPhone 6 at 600, totaling to my 1,000. So my 1,000 was the consideration received. My 1,000 here was my consideration what? Received. Now the other question then is, then I say less fair value of net assets at date of disposal. This is no longer at date of acquisition. This is no longer at acquisition date. So notice, net assets is share capital and reserves at disposal date. But remember, remember yet to pay attention on this part. If you add the two, cash and fair value of remaining interest, this gives me what I held. So if I had 70% and I sold 30%, meaning I, I, I am now remaining with 40%. So if you add the 30 plus 40, they give me 70%. They don't give me 100%. But net assets here, net assets here are 100%. But the proceeds here is for 70%, meaning the cash I got plus what, I, what remained. 30% I sold plus 40% remaining. That's 70%. But the net assets here are 100% because it's share capital and total reserves. So what I then have to do is I can't deduct proceeds of 70% to deduct 100% of net assets. I then have to take out NCI here so that it will be proceeds of 70 less net assets of 70. No wonder why NCI is deducted here. It is removed from this figure to reduce it also from 70% from 100% to 70%. Now in another text, they just multiply this line here by 70%. They just say share capital plus reserves times 70 percent so that the nci line is no longer there it is still the same now goodwill is also deducted because you recognize the goodwill when you acquired when there was business combination if there's no more business combination goodwill is subtracted is it is is de-recognized so to speak then you get group gain or loss on disposal but there's a point I want to emphasize. This goodwill here that we have here, it's not goodwill at acquisition, but it is the carrying amount of goodwill after you have removed all impairments from acquisition. Because these are net assets at disposal, meaning this is goodwill at disposal, not at acquisition. So if this is goodwill at disposal, it means this goodwill is carrying amount of goodwill after we have deducted any impairment over the years. If there's no impairment, it would mean that this goodwill would be the same as the goodwill at acquisition. So this is group gain or loss on disposal. And now the question is, say, where do I put this? Group gain, in, group gain or loss at, at disposal. Where do I record this? That's the question. Where do I put group gain or loss on disposal? So this is put, this is recognized um, a group gain or loss on disposal. It's recognized as, as other income. It's actually other income in consolidated, uh, in consolidated profit or loss. Now it's not recognized in other comprehensive income. No, in profit or loss. Now, on this good view, let me emphasize, on this good view, it's like you say at acquisition, at acquisition, less any impairment. So if there is any impairment, remember to take it out. 
And I said, why NCI is deducted there? It's because net assets are 100%, and your your income here is for 70% that you disposed. So you need to you need to subtract NCI from net assets so that you, you say proceeds of 70%, less assets of 70% to get group gain or loss. Right. So so that's 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 the main issue. But let let me let me again say something else here. If you do that situation where you had an iPhone 12 and you climb down, you get some cash and iPhone 6. Effectively speaking, iPhone 6 you have purchased it, even though there was no cash outlay. Ah, get that right. I had my iPhone 12. I got to the vendor and the vendor said, iPhone 12, your iPhone 12 is a fair value of 1,000. And I said, I need iPhone 6, and the, which is my remaining associate. And the vendor said, iPhone 6 is trading at 600. So I'm going to give you cash 400 and iPhone 6 of 600. But are you not seeing the substance of the transaction is that iPhone 6, effectively speaking, I have purchased it, even though I did not actually pay the cash. So iPhone 6, I have purchased it. So the remaining interest is assumed to have been acquired at fair value. So when you are now consolidating the associate going forward, when you say cost of the associate, it's now the fair value of that iPhone 6 on the date you sold your iPhone 12. That becomes the cost of the associate. You, you, it, it appears like you have acquired it, but there is no, there was, you didn't pay because the substance of the transaction is you sold your iPhone 12 and you were given your 1,000 cash, and from the 1,000 you then say, of the 600 now give me iPhone 6, but you, you were not given the 1,000, you were just given 400 in iPhone 6, but practically speaking that's what you have actually done. It's like you were given your 1,000 and then you, from the 1,000 you used for 600 to buy iPhone 6. And you are now left with 400 and iPhone 6. So from the, in your books going forward, the fair value of previously held interest is assumed to be the purchase price. So if the, I mean the fair value of the remaining interest, the fair value of the remaining interest is assumed to be the cost or the purchase price. So if the remaining interest is an associate, you can now start going forward to say cost of the associate, whilst you are referring to the fair value of the remaining interest. I'm sure you understand that part. Sure you understand that part. So this is what you do. And remember, this formula is to calculate group gain or loss on disposal. You need to commit this formula to memory. We, we expect those doing S, uh, SBR to understand that. You have to understand that. So in the consolidated, uh, this one I said, in the consolidated profit or loss, you consolidate up to the date of disposal. You know what? This only this issue of, of consolidating up to the date of disposal, it is done when control is left, is lost. But if you dispose from 90 and you are now left with 60%, you consolidate the whole year because you have not lost control. But this time you have lost control. So if you dispose on 1st of September, you consolidate from January to August, provided your year and is 31 December. Because from, from September going forward, it was no longer a subsidiary. So there's no need to consolidate. The, so when you are consolidating the results of a disposed subsidiary in the profit or loss, you'll be time apportioning them. You'll be time apportioning to say revenue, revenue for nine months, time apportioning, cost of sales for nine months, just for the subsidiary. And in the consolidated statement of financial position, you don't consolidate because you no longer have the subsidiary. You have disposed it. Once you lost control, you don't consolidate. But if the remaining interest is, is the associate, you then have to equity account the associate going forward. And how you equity account the associate is what we have discussed before. You say cost of the associate. This time, the fair value of the remaining interest is the cost of the associate. Right? Then, 
this is another very important point here. This one is a very, very import, important point that I, I also want to, to, to talk to you about. It's like what we have calculated above, it was group gain or loss on disposal. This one was group gain or loss, meaning consolidated gain or loss, meaning this goes to consolidated financial statements. But, when, but the parent also need to recognize what is called gain or loss in its separate financial statements. The gain or loss in its separate financial statements. And what is that gain or loss in the separate financial statements? This one is not calculated even, even the way we have calculated that one. No. Gain or loss in separate financial statements is a, just a two-step procedure. It's simply saying disposal proceeds, less carrying amount of the investment disposed, and then you have got gain or loss. But allow me to explain that. So you would notice that you'll be told that Atlens has got investment in subsidiary. So like you have investment in AA, that's your subsidiary. Then here uh, it is at cost. This is in my separate financial statements and it was 80%. So as Atlens, we purchased our shares in AA for 5,000. And then these are millions. And then we then disposed. We are told that we disposed. We disposed the forty percent, or or we disposed fifty percent of our holding. Of our, uh, let's say forty percent. Just say ah uh, fifty. It's, it's okay. Fifty percent. We disposed fifty percent for. And, and we're given, we disposed 50% and we're given 4,300,000. Right, for 4,300,000. Now, I want you to, I want to calculate gain or loss on disposal at length in at length separate financial separate financial statements. Now, in Atlant separate financial statements, how do I calculate the gain or loss on disposal? I come to my end out here. I say disposal proceeds. So I come here and say disposal proceeds. Also proceeds, I, I put 4,300. And then I say less Carrying value of investment disposed. Carrying value of or carrying amount of investment disposed. Now, I disposed the 40%, but remember, carrying amount of the entire investment is 80%, but I disposed the 40%. So, carrying value of investment disposed is just... I disposed the, uh, I, I disposed the 50% source. So it's 50 over 80 times 5,000. Because 80 is 5,000, and I disposed the 50. So by proportion, the carrying value will be 50 over 80 times 5, 1, 2, 3. So I dispose, the carrying value of the investment disposed is 3, 1, 25. So what I then do is I calculate gain or loss is 4, 300 minus 3, 125. This gain, this gain or loss is in separate financial statements. It's not consolidated. This is just computed in two. It's a gain or loss in separate financial statements. The one which is consolidated is calculated as I have illustrated here, which is the group gain or loss on disposal. This is consolidated. But this one is not consolidated. So I, if I, as I have told you that this gain is not consolidated and is calculated as follows. Now you understand how you calculate it. Now, disposals where control is retained. Disposals where control is retained. Now, uh, this is like you had... When, when, when there's a disposal in which control is retained, it's like you had 70, 80 percent 
now you dispose 20% and you are now left with 60%. Under the circumstances, you don't calculate group gain or loss on disposal. Notice, you don't calculate group gain or loss on disposal because you have not lost control. You have retained the control. So, so the, 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 what you calculate here perhaps, you calculate the gain or loss in separate financial statements. This gain, this gain, is this gain or loss is calculated regardless of the scope of the disposal. So even if you dispose from 80 and you are left with 60, this should be calculated. But group gain or loss on disposal, which is above here, this is calculated whenever control is lost. Meaning this is not calculated always. It is calculated whenever control is lost. But this one is calculated whenever you dispose. So in this case, if I dispose from 80 and I'm left with 60, I don't calculate group gain or loss. I just calculate gain or loss in separate financial statements. But this one, again, is not consolidated. Meaning if I'm not asked about it, I don't even calculate it. But what I then do is I calculate what is called adjustment to parent equity. Adjustment to parent equity. So if I dispose from 80% and I'm now left with 60%, what I what I have done is I have I have sold my assets to NCI. That's what I have done. Because at 80% NCI was 20. Now I have 60 NCI is, is now at 40. So what belonged to me, I have sold it to NCI, but I still control. So by selling to NCI, I receive cash. But there are assets which were mine, which I then transfer to NCI. No wonder why we say increase, increase in NCI in net assets at date of disposal. Increase in NCI in goodwill. It, that is if, if we are using full goodwill method. And then this will be an adjustment to equity. And this adjustment is the one which goes to consolidated financial statements. If it's positive, credit to retained earnings. If it's negative, deduct from retained earnings. So let me repeat. If there is a disposal in which control is retained, you don't calculate group gain or loss on disposal. Also, you consolidate for the whole year. But when you are calculating share of profit attributable to NCI, you need to understand that NCI was initially 20% for nine months. And for the other three months, it's now 40% because you have increased the NCI from 20 to 40 by your disposal. So if you are calculating share of profit attributable to NCI, you then have to time a portion to say for the nine months, NCI was 20%. For the other three months, NCI is now 40%. So this is basically what I have written here. In the consolidated financial statements, do what, 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 what. So this is about disposals. This is all you have to know about disposals. So you may say, say, what is it that what is it that is, is coming out next? Okay. Oh, last page, page nine of nine. Okay. Ah, in the in the next five minutes, I will explain it. But before I explain what is coming out next, I need to give you time to breathe by saying something. Uh, I'm going to send, as I've said, I'm going to send video with past papers where I explained this, all this. So this this is this is one explanation of the notes and video with past papers. I am still the same tutor. I'm going to send to you on what in our WhatsApp class group. Then after sending it to you in our WhatsApp class group, make sure you play it, understand it, not once, not twice, but three times or even four times. Why? Because number one is on groups. And the reason we do it first is to alleviate fears. You play this one about twice. If you play it tomorrow, play it also around Friday, do the practice or, uh, or illustration video on Saturday and perhaps on Sunday. And then next week, we are going to discuss something totally different, which is consolidating foreign operation. In other words, the subsidiary that you are consolidating is now in another currency. And so before you consolidate, you are, there are procedures 
to follow before you consolidate, which I'll be taking you through. And we do past papers again on that. So this is your to-do list. I have to say it in the course of the video, so that when you are playing the video, yeah, there are these intermittencies, uh, interruptions, where I will be reverting you on your to-do list. So I, I will share with you that with another video. You play that. So once I, once I explain like this, the video is equally four hours long. So we can't have another four hours long when there's a video where I was the tutor and I've explained everything in that video with this video. So you play that. If you still need explanations, you let me know. That's how the modus operandi, that's how we proceed. Um, okay. Um, last but not least, uh, this is page number nine now, the last page. Hey, at least we are done. Okay. Last but not least, joint arrangements. Now, you do notice that we were talking about groups, 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 but associates and stuff, but we have never discussed the situation where you and I enter into a joint range. How then do you account for that? Because a joint venture is not a subsidiary. It is called a joint arrangement. You know, in, in our normal interactions, we always say, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in a joint venture, but technically speaking, that word is, is, is mostly misused. Joint arrangements are of two types. Listen, joint arrangements are of two types. There is what is called a joint operation. This is IFRS 11, joint arrangements. There is what is called a joint operation, and there is what is called a joint venture. And the accounting for these two are different. So there is a joint operation, and there is a joint venture. Now, let me take you through one by one, and let me say, suppose I and yourself, we want to enter into a joint arrangement. Under what circumstances do we call it a joint operation? Here are the circumstances. If you and I enter into a joint venture, suppose I, I know the farmers, the fish farmers, and you know the market for fish, and I know the fish farmers, you know the market for fish, so we can exploit that opportunity. I then bring in knowledge of fish farmers, and you bring in knowledge for fish, and we enter into a joint arrangement, which is called joint operation. Here is how it goes. In a joint operation, we don't set up a separate legal entity. No. We don't set up a separate legal entity. We don't do that. How we go about it is we, we just share expenses and revenues and profits in, in an agreed ratio. So it's like, you let us explain this opportunity I get. Uh, if I say I get 40%, you get 60%, or whichever ratio, you, we, we share 50-50. But in as much as we don't form a separate legal entity or a special purpose vehicle, that is called a joint operation. It's not called a joint venture. So in your books, how then would you account for a joint operation? It's simple. In a joint operation, we do what is called line-by-line -line accounting. Get it right? Line by line accounting. What does that mean? If I'm, account if I'm accounting for my sales, I say my sales plus share of my sales in the joint venture. In, I mean in the joint operation. Cost of sales, my cost of sales plus my share of cost of sales in the joint operation. Expenses, my expenses plus my share of expenses in the joint operation. Liabilities, my liabilities plus my share of liabilities in the joint operation. My assets, my assets plus my share of assets in the joint operation. So you can see I am doing it line by line. This is how we account for joint operation. That's what you equally do. So what are the features of a joint operation? Say once again, there is no special purpose vehicle or separate legal entity which is formed for that. Number two, how do we account it for it? Say, we do it line by line accounting. Number three, what about our liabilities in a joint operation? Are they limited? No. 
liabilities in your joint operation are not limited because in a joint operation, you don't form a separate legal entity. Now, it, what about joint venture, say? If, we, if you and I, same business opportunity, we now have a joint venture. What do we do? If it's a joint venture, it's like this. We've, we, the fish business, the fish opportunity I said earlier, you and I, we form, we form a separate legal entity, meaning a special purpose vehicle, meaning a company specifically meant to exploit that opportunity. And the knowledge of fish farmers that I have, I, deal, I sell it, meaning I give it to the joint venture, to this SPV, special purpose vehicle. And your knowledge of market for fish, you also render it to the joint venture. So you, we, you and I, we lose ownership to the assets we transfer to the joint venture. Reason, this is a separate legal entity that we form. So it then assumes ownership of the assets. So we, we no longer account for it by line by line accounting because it's not a subsidiary, rather it's a joint venture. So what do we do? What about liabilities in a joint venture? Do they extend to us as the venturers? No. Liabilities don't extend to us because that one is a separate legal entity, meaning it bears its own liabilities. What about the assets which we contributed to the joint venture? Are they still ours? No. The assets belong to the joint venture because it's a separate legal entity. What about accounting? Accounting in the joint venture, a, a investment in the joint venture is equity accounted. Meaning you and I, we do equity accounting in the same way we were doing, we were dealing with investment in associates. What do you mean so say? Uh, when you are accounting for your investment in the joint venture, you say cost of the assets that you delivered to the joint venture, then you add after adding, after after calculating, then you add share of profit of the associates from the joint venture. You take your share of profits. You don't do it line by line to say sales, cost of sales, asset, liabilities, etc. No. Share of profits. And then if you receive dividend, less dividend, if the joint venture needs to be tested for impairment, you say less impairment. In the same way we do with associate. Cost of the investment of the assets I deliver to the joint venture, edge share of profit that I got from the joint venture, less any dividend received from the joint venture, less any impairment of the joint venture, meaning the share of my impairment in that particular joint venture. That's the carrying amount is the carrying amount of my investment in the joint venture. Now, after getting carrying amount, where do I put it, say, in the statement of financial position, where do I put that carrying amount? Carrying amount of investment in the joint venture, it just comes to investments in the statement of financial position. Where you put investment in an associate, that's exactly where you put investment in the joint venture. So here, if it was an associate, we said you'd say investment in an associate. If it's a joint venture, the carrying amount after you have equity accounted it. Remember, it is an equity accounted in the same way as the associate. So you then say investment in joint venture. Then you would say, say, how about the share of profit I was getting from the joint venture? I now know I debit my investment in the joint venture with the share of profit. But where does the credit entry goes? It is accounted for in this, it is equity accounted like an associate. In an associate, the share of profit of the associate goes to retained earnings. In the joint venture, in the same way, the share of profit from the joint venture is credited to retained earnings. In the same way, impairment of the associate is debited to retained earnings. Impairment of the investment in the joint venture is equally debited to retained earnings. And a joint venture involves formation of a separate legal entity. So I must thank you guys for committing yourself through this lengthy lecture. I appreciate the lecture is a bit lengthy. But notice I just exceeded with 23 minutes. It wouldn't have made sense for us to wait to, to just cut the lecture and then take the 23 minutes. You know, the energy might have been eroded already and the momentum shattered. So in this case, I must thank you now. This is your immediate to-do list. Uh, the topic is already done. Illustrative video, I'm going to send it. You'll see it in our class WhatsApp group. 
if you have not joined the lecture to the, because we are supposed to be 15 but at times we were, we were not reaching the maximum quorum for those who are joining the video will be recorded as you can see it's being recorded so it will be streamed live on our youtube it will be streamed on our youtube so immediately after we are done i'm sure my colleagues are already doing it you know i have guys who do this for me who maintain my my social media app i'm sure they are already about to stream it so when you when you receive the video please feel free to like the video to share the video and to subscribe to my youtube channel so that everything will be fine but in final analysis i encourage you to join the actual live lecture there is an element of you seeing the visual features the tone of your sales voice getting it first time that has got an educative effect not downplaying the existence of a recorded video because this is convenience of online lecture if you don't attend the lecture you can still benefit from the video from the recorded video because we know adult education there's still a lot of yeah, those at work, a lot of issues at work. So it's not a train smash. Play the video as if you were actually in the lecture so that it comes out right. On that note, have a wonderful week ahead, guys. Cheers. Bye.